three, two, one. Two thousand one. Two thousand and one. Twenty oh one, they'll say. Twenty oh one, they'll say. Hi, this is Sardonicast. I'm Adam from Your Movie Sucks. And that was a uh, newly uncovered song that was supposed to be uh, promotional for Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, but he rejected it 50 years ago, and it has now seen the light of day. <laughs> and it's pretty fucking funny, honestly. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Okay. Who else is here? I'm totally going to have to check that out. I was wondering. Uh, I'm Ralph from YouTube.com slash Ralph the Movie Maker. And I'm Alex from IHG, and that was quite a ditty you oh, man. Out for yeah. us. <laughs> it's really funny. I just linked it to that. you if, if you want to listen to it right now. Cause, yeah, totally. Yeah, I want to hear your reactions. It's pretty yeah, funny. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw you tweet about it. Where'd you put it? In the, on, in the Discord. It, in the Discord oh, yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? This is awful. <laughs> 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 it's like my new favorite bad song. Yeah. 2001, they say. And God, nobody said it. They were wrong. <laughs> they made a bold <laughs> prediction, and it did not come true. No. Nobody said 2001. Yeah, they really focused on the wrong yeah. word. Well, there was a, another score composed for 2001 that they rejected, basically, yeah. and and used like just classical music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it wound up just working completely. And not that that score is bad, but it, it would have been like this. It would have made the movie age kind of poorly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. If this song yeah. was associated with the film, right, like yeah. if it was actually in it, which I'm not sure it was supposed <laughs> to be in the movie, but if it was in the movie, it would be like, oh, this is the one thing that you would say today, like, Oh, this is from the '60s. Everything else is just like yeah. timeless, but mm -hmm. it's just one yeah, thing that, that would was hold so back. right. That would ruin it. <laughs> very, very goofy tone too. Yeah, it's got a lot of dislikes too. Yeah, like the version of Lintus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's pretty funny, Alex. So I've got a question for you, and it does not have to do with your oh, no. British heritage okay. this time. <laughs> last time, maybe last episode, whichever episode, hmm. you mentioned you have a. An Xbox Series X? Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have one. So I've actually been wrestling with like the justification for owning one because like I don't know why anyone would buy one and I'm trying to understand. Could you could you help us understand why <laughs> one would buy an Xbox Series X? So I do realise it is it is one of those a little bit and like why would you not get a PlayStation over it? But I, I don't know, I've always been embedded in the, the Xbox ecosystem. I use Game Pass a fair amount, so okay. I haven't bought a game for m so many months. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also... <laughs> this is so sad, but I love achievements, and mm -hmm. I can't leave them. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, I don't like playing games um, at, like, my work desk. I like separating the idea of, like, play and work, so... So you just you don't want to use a PC, is what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, although I do occasionally. I don't know. It's just I don't know. I just got one. Can <laughs> I've been using it quite a lot actually, mostly because of Game Pass. Like I played Doom Eternal on it for so okay. not to pay anything, and yeah, I've been enjoying it actually. I wasn't trying to be like you know like this brand <laughs> is always superior because doing? of tribalism <laughs> or something. I'm just like I like Xbox too. Like Halo is one of my favorite games ever, but. Like, all of the games that they're releasing on the Xbox Series X, they're cross-releasing on PC, and so it's mm -hmm. just like, there's mm -hmm. no... If if consoles don't have exclusivity, then there's no real reason to get them, in my opinion. And I mean, like, yeah, it's a good thing that they don't have exclusivity, because then I'm not forced to get it, but... Yeah, I get what Alex is saying. But also, like, I, I buy these games, and I kind of just connect my PlayStation controller to the computer, and I play it on my bed. You know, I yeah. plug the TV in. So I play pretty yeah, casually, yeah. too. Yeah. It, but I get what you're saying. Like, mm -hmm. it's a pain in the ass to play at your work desk. Because <laughs> you feel like, you know, like you're working almost. Hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. just like a mindset thing. Trying mm -hmm. to just break it up a little bit, you know? Yeah. Instead of, like, spending all my time in one one position. But you, you had, a, yeah. you had like, a an X-Bone, too, right? <laughs> like the Xbox One? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, had, I had the bone. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And I'm just like... Yeah, I had the bone. I know that it's backwards, the new one, the Series X is backwards compatible with all the other generations, but the backwards compatibility list is the exact same as what the X-Bone can already play. And so if I'm a person <laughs> that has a PC and an X-Bone, then I guess there will be literally zero games that come out that will justify buying a Series X. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I've been I like bought a ton of games on the 360 and the Xbox One, so my whole library's there. So I think it's just yeah, just sticking to it. If I if I'd hopped on Steam earlier, I definitely would have stayed with Steam. But I just mm. can't be jumping to all these different. Like I've just <laughs> got to pick one, mm-hmm. and then like I'll play the PlayStation exclusives. I'll play what I have to on PC. But yeah, 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 that makes sense. Just keep it simple. I like stream all my games anyway, pretty much. So yeah, that's true. And I, I think it's really more cost chair. effective in the long run to have a PC because you don't have to get new consoles. Mm-hmm. There's usually remasters. Like if you get a PS4, you get a remaster. Mm-hmm. Um, but PC, you just play it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and you and just you upgrade can, your graphics card, right? Yeah. You can upgrade one part of it instead of needing to jump to the next generation or yeah, what they exactly. did last generation with PS4 Pro and Series <laughs> X half step, or yeah. Xbox One X. It's so con- I hate the Microsoft Xbox titles. It's so con- <laughs> yeah, I can't stand the way they did the it. The Xbox One X was the midpoint generation thing. Yeah, and I just found that to be so slimy and sneaky from both Sony and Microsoft because it was like, okay, they're basically admitting at this point <laughs> yeah. that the technology is growing so exponentially that consoles cannot keep up with PCs, so they have to release a new generation to keep them updated. But they they didn't call it a new generation because they were like, okay. People will notice that it's been less than six years this time. So let's just call, let's call it Xbox One mm-hmm. X and PS4 Pro. And it's like, okay, it's using the same user interface and, you know, same software basically. But it's like better stats. So you can, you know, they're like going into the 60 FPS and like 4K stuff, just inching in there, but pretending it's not like a new generation of yeah, console when it might as well it, be. It really at that cannot point. compete. The, so many new PC parts are released every year. You just it'd be impossible. These like consoles have to be in, certified over like years and design. Yeah, because it's <laughs> yeah. just one thing. Got, like, the PS6. And I hear that what, what's intriguing me a lot about the um, the Xbox shit going on is like I was hearing. I didn't look too much into it, but I was hearing that the Series X is that what this xbox that's the new one right i think that's what it's you're confusing me now <laughs> yeah, yeah series, the new xbox the new <laughs> it looks xbox. speaking of 2001 it looks like the monolith <laughs> yeah you're right <laughs> that's funny <laughs> i heard that they were doing like a kind of having it so that it was like the reason they were also cross-releasing games on pc is because they wanted to like join forces and be like kind of a hybrid experience and like having both of them is like the ultimate thing, but I have yet to see how exactly that will play out or how they're planning on making that happen. I don't know. The Yeah, I think their plan is to go, they just want to be on everything. Yeah. Because they have this like app thing you can like stream games to. Yeah. And like they're, they're quite at the forefront, I think, with I mean, streaming tech. But yeah. The internet isn't there though. The, yeah, like the that's wide it. support with good enough internet. Maybe if you're in the heart of a city, Fiber, you'll be able to find internet wired. good enough. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, Microsoft has had that problem where they're they're ahead of the curve in certain ways. Where like from their bubble, like it makes sense, but when you actually get it to the people, it can be lost in translation a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like with their awful original. Um, xbox one reveal do you remember how bad oh, it was, that was it was the worst thing ever <laughs> kind of. it was so funny because there was fucking what was his name yeah. like yeah, phil something the fucking microsoft <laughs> puppet phil spencer spencer yeah and he was out there like promoting the expo and saying like no all of these terrible anti-consumer things this is how we design the console we can't just change it and then zero people pre-ordered it and then they, he came back out and he was like, "We're changing the console." <laughs> it's like, it's it's uh, where yeah. like Connect wasn't like you didn't have to have Connect for it. It didn't have to be always on. You could now trade your games and stuff. Like all these crazy anti-consumer things that were revealed about it before launch. That just like they had to change it, otherwise, literally nobody would buy it because Sony wasn't doing those things. If perhaps both consoles were doing these ridiculous anti-consumer things, then you know they could get away with it, but. Yeah, and it was just like TV, 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 TV. Oh yeah, what, use your console to watch TV. Yeah, <laughs> HDMI Instead in. Of, like, playing games on it. On, yeah, <laughs> like, nobody used that. Mm-hmm. I didn't use it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so weird. The Kinect was the worst part, though. Aside from how just obscenely large that console was, <laughs> like, it was like, yeah, it looked like a it was VCR, like three yeah. bricks, and like, it was it was together. so expensive. It was so much more money than the PS4 because it came so with that weird. fucking camera. Yeah, yeah and yeah. yeah, like that was the. The biggest mess. They were try- They they had made it so necessary to use this 
gimmicky add-on that was pretty much already at the end of its shelf life by the time that generation of console came out. Like, yeah. Kinect was dying. They, like, immediately stopped support right after the console launched. <laughs> yeah. You know? I guess for some reason on the 360, Kinect, like, sold weirdly well. But that's on, like, an install base. Because it was a new thing. Way bigger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like a gimmick on a thing everyone already owns. Yeah. It was also a response to the Wii, because the Wii did the gimmicky thing with, like, motion controls. Mm-hmm. And then Sony and, and Xbox followed, but instead of yeah. coming, you know, attached to the console and being like, oh, yeah, this is, like a necessary thing to play the game they were just like oh it's an add-on there are certain games you can play like this certain games that you can play better with it blah 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 yeah there was the playstation move with a camera and a yep. controller that oh, yeah, thing sucked <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> that thing was terrible <laughs> yeah i mean it was okay i think i had resistance 3 for it and then this like that pet game where you have like a dog and you, you like raise them to be like whatever it, it's like a pet game that yeah. was fun but I mean, that's there's it. a billion of it's those. like it, it's <laughs> not worth four hundred dollars yeah it's, it's not worth whatever Wonder book yeah it's oh, like yeah. one of those webcam games with a yeah i know exactly game. what you're talking <laughs> about but i don't remember the title i worked at yeah, best buy yeah. when it was a thing so oh uh, okay like on the displays and shit yeah that thing yeah. wasn't that great yeah you it's so weird i don't know what consoles are going to do because they're becoming like more and more unnecessary and if microsoft is now the winners like nintendo because they just went the complete opposite strategy i guess so yeah because it's portable it's like not going for power i think they all have very valuable ip like yeah. nintendo has mario and all that shit and then sony has uncharted they have last of us and so if they just put out those games for their console exclusively i, I would get those consoles mm-hmm. just to play them you know so i think yeah but it's well like you're forced way. to i hate that like i would yeah. too but, you know, it's like part of my job in a way, but mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. it's I don't want to have to do that. It's like they're they're insisting yeah. their own necessity yeah. in the same way where it's like, you know, in many areas when Uber was illegal for, you know, places like Vancouver, it was illegal up until like a couple a year or two ago. The only reason mm-hmm. you would take a taxi is because Uber is illegal. It's like they're actively preventing you from having yeah. the service that you want. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'll pay for a taxi, but mm-hmm. you're kind of being forced to because it's, you know, like that's your only option. Even though there are better options that you should be able to have, you're, that, yeah. that's what console exclusivity is, basically. Yeah, but there's some cool things like if there's like an exclusive PlayStation title, they like use the controller a bit more. You mm-hmm. know, like you can use the touchpad and they actually integrate the use of the PlayStation That's a bit fine. better in there's the game. There's nothing stopping it. Yeah. And I know. also think it helps with like piracy because I know there's a lot of piracy with video games. And I think if a game comes out for like PlayStation or something like that, there's less piracy because people just download it off that that console instead of like going on the internet or whatever mm-hmm. <laughs> and like getting it on their PC and downloading yeah. it. I think it's a good like anti-piracy measure and I could yeah, see why I mean, studios would want to make games with PlayStation because they might make more money from that. More people would play their game. You know yeah, what I mean? Like something like You that. could do what GTA 5 did, release the games on Microsoft and Sony and then yeah. you know, work on the PC one and release that one a year later mm-hmm. by the time that like You've already yeah, sold as much as possible yeah. as you can on those other two consoles. Like, I have nothing That's against true. that. Red Dead Two did that too, right? So, mm-hmm. like, I don't see that as a mm-hmm. terrible business yeah. model. And like, the PC version is yeah. better, so it's like it's not even that big of a deal if you have to wait for it. It's like, okay, well, you know, this is like the ultimate mm-hmm. edition or whatever. They've already made like tons of money from it, so it doesn't even matter if people pirate it at that point. Yeah, it's almost pointless buying new games now anyway, because they're always shit until oh my a year God. later, until they've like updated That everything. Cyberpunk thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. That really made me lose faith in PS5. Yeah, I got my refund for right. Cyberpunk. That, that, that's the new <laughs> console, and then it could like it could barely run on that. It's like, mm-hmm. why would you get a PS5 if, yeah. if it can't run these games? True. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, the, the differences between the Spider-Man Miles Morales PS4 and PS5 were like, unnoticeable except for parts where they intentionally downgraded on the ps4 like they made everybody's Ooh. hair look like the same texture as like bird feathers like every white person's hair was just like this weird like roughly mess where it was just like what the hell is this and then you look at like oh, yeah. the original spider-man ps4 game so not miles morales and it's just like oh nobody's hair looked that stupid before this is like an intentional <laughs> downgrade to make the ps5 version look better Right, that it's game is so, so short too. <laughs> oh, it was—they probably it was rushed bullshit. it out. It should have been DLC. The, hit the console release, yeah. It was it hit complete the console bullshit. Release, that's why. Yeah. it was like a Battlefield Four where they just kind of rushed it out. Yeah, it was really annoying. Yeah, for <laughs> yeah. PS4. 
Halo Hold Infinite's going to suck. This is a movie podcast. But <laughs> no, I don't mind. <laughs> talking about... I love talking about video games. Games are art. Mm -hmm. They are. Yeah. I play more video games probably at this point than I watch movies. Cut I mean, scenes for movies? Sheer, like hours. Yeah, that's true. But you skip them, so. Yeah, Yeah, I do skip them. For Spider-Man, <laughs> I skip them because they, they sucked. <laughs> Get mad. The Red Dead ones are good. I don't skip those. I love yeah, those. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ones that you like. It's got to be like an interesting story, right? Here, here's, here's what I feel about like the gaming industry right now, and I might have said this before, but like the things to look out for and pay attention to in the gaming industry are all like on the indie scene right now. AAA gaming has fucked up so much, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> like all these big super budget games or whatever. Like you can really see the the negative effect that like shareholders and like financial interest has yeah. on a lot of these yeah. titles like it really ruins art like we see this a lot with movies right already we see this a lot with every art form but like particularly the ones that have a lot of like hype and right now video games are what probably the most profitable entertainment industry right now like they're insane with how much like most likely markup oh, yeah. they have yeah. on like the games themselves and... yeah you can monetize it so many of oh yeah the di yeah yeah, just think and of Fortnite. Like, and so, like, shit, yeah. when you have shareholders, and it's like, okay, well, the main goal now is to maximize the profits, right? It's not about the art anymore. You're going to have day one DLC. You're going to have, like, so many of these things. Just, like, watch one of Crobe Cat's videos. By the way, he's back because of <laughs> Cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah, it's like an hour long, that video. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, like, that one um, Evolve or whatever. I watched that one again recently. From Crobe Cat, C R O W B C A T, if anybody wants to check out this awesome YouTube channel. Great channel. But yeah, you can really just see how the influence of money can like completely decimate a product, <laughs> right? And just make it like so that nobody wants to use it or play it. You know, you see this mm -hmm. across all our forms. Yeah, and the copycat stuff is bad too. Mm -hmm. Like someone stumbles across some kind of system that works. Yeah. Like Fortnite with a battle oh, yeah. pass, so then it just becomes oh yeah, everyone, every single game needs it's to have this thing. It's become the standard. Yeah, mm -hmm. every single basically yeah, FPS or any trend. big franchise has a battle royale mode now. Yeah, where they charge you a fuck ton of money. <laughs> yeah, now Halo has Sprint. <laughs> Woo! Fuck off. Yeah, they're doing like an open world Halo now. It's like what? Is it really open world? Like what mm -hmm. are they calling it? It looks so stupid <laughs> and bad. I can't believe it. Focus on the story. Isn't that what made like the first Halo so great? Not, I mean the gameplay mm -hmm. too, obviously, but like. Like, it wasn't this, like, huge, ridiculous spectacle. Like, it, maybe for the mm -hmm. time, like, it, it did for sure break a lot of boundaries and introduce a lot of new things to the genre, right? It changed the way shooters were made, but, like, the core mechanics of the game were just, like, what is fun, right? Like, what feels good to mm -hmm. play? What is a good map design, you know? Somebody's not going to get lost here, like... But that simple aesthetic is there yeah. as well, with the chanting Very. monks and everything. Yeah. It's, like... It was so like mystical. It's completely yeah. lost that now. But they cared about mm -hmm. like the cinematic qualities too. It's just like the mm -hmm. fucking three four three industries yeah. didn't know shit about how to like make a story, make it cinematic, or even like just make something that looks good. Like everything looks like fucking <laughs> Roblox, you know? Like they look like l plastic Lego figures or whatever. Like it's so weird now. Yeah. It's like, well, you got four K sixty FPS now. Like <laughs> that's what matters apparently. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, speaking of like bad cutscenes, I recently ran through Halo Four again, and oh my god, <laughs> those cutscenes, man! They are, they have some really bad like age dialogue stuff. Mm. Yeah, I, I remember at the time thinking it was kind of cool because it's just on the hype train for it, but <laughs> yeah, it's it's really not good. Has none of that charm. Yeah, I'm just like focusing on individuals now. That's why the Japanese gaming industry is still like doing pretty good. Is because like a lot of their games are led by a lot of like creative individuals. It feels like more like sure. It feels more like either a person's vision or a collective vision from a bunch of people that have the same ideas, rather than like a game created by committee sort of thing. You know? Yeah, yeah. I played like Yakuza mm -hmm. Zero. I oh man, I'm called. going through it's that right now. Like, it's I got so a, much fun. Yeah, I got it for discount on PlayStation. I'm like, let me try it, and it's actually a lot of fun. It's crack. It's very funny. Like it has a lot of personality, yeah. right? It's not like quite GTA in terms of like what you can do, but it's very funny and it has a lot of personality. Mm -hmm. That's what people like about like Kojima and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even if it's flawed. Exactly. Like I would rather yeah. have some like pretentious garbage like Death Stranding where it's like, <laughs> okay, at least it's his idea, even if it's a terrible idea, rather than just something where it's like, yeah. oh, this was 
for the shareholders sort of like you know this was yeah, just this was for ea <laughs> they have that ea battle pass or ea pass where you can get like a bunch of their games like mm -hmm. in one bundle you pay every month mm -hmm. and i looked at it because i was considering it and they don't have enough games that i think of course would, would make it worth it yeah like i like battlefront 2. oh my god that's about it and even that's like a scam fifa <laughs> <laughs> mm. fifa yeah anything ea <laughs> Remember when they tried to get away with the online pass? So a lot of people won't remember this. Oh, yeah. Or, or maybe too young. But there was a point in time um, where EA was very specifically EA. And I think there was maybe some other companies that were like, okay, well, if EA is doing it, we can get away with Sony it too. Sony did it too. Yeah. Where they were like, okay, there's a big market in reselling for video games because video games are fucking expensive they're way more expensive than movies right fucking at the time it was like 60 dollars. Yeah. now it's mm -hmm. like 80 dollars per game of triple a titles mm -hmm. and so they they looked at like stores like eb games gamestop or whatever they're just like they're making money off of reselling the games we want a cut of that too so they started introducing mechanics into their games where if you wanted to access any of the online features of said game that you purchase then you had to have a code that was specifically limited to your account only so if you traded the game then because the code is already on your account somebody else buys a used game then they have to pay an extra ten dollars to access the online features oh yeah and then their mindset in making that profitable was like okay now every single game that is ea has to have some sort of online component so that people feel obligated to get the online pass, otherwise they can't use it. So in yeah. game series that were already single player like Dead Space, so Dead Space 3, they were like, no, it's got to be co-op now. It's got to be a co-op game <laughs> so that people have to use the online pass to get... Yeah, right? I remember that. And I'm glad that idea failed. I'm glad that eventually they moved away from that. So now if yeah, you get Dead that. Space 3, you can get the online pass for free. Like, they don't give a shit anymore because it's disgusting and people didn't fall yeah, for they, it. Yeah, they were trying to counteract, like, GameStop, too, w yeah. which would resell games. At, like, exactly. Basically, GameStop would get the money and not EA. So they were trying yeah, to, like, but diminish that. Fuck, can you imagine, like, books doing right, exactly. that? Or, like, CDs uh -huh. or vinyl <laughs> or movies? Yeah. Like, fuck, like, it's so stupid and predatory. That's capitalism. It's fucking They're awful. Like, whatever, we need to up the profits, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it ruins art is like the point that I'm making <laughs> yeah, a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Mass Effect 2 didn't even really have like an online thing. Of course. Because it had to have yeah. that like pass. There was like the Cerberus network yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. So if you just got like, a secondhand copy, you just didn't get like some content. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they had the they had like the versus online mode in Mass Effect 3. And then they had that like weird shit where it was like, oh, you have to constantly like look at some online thing that helps you in the campaign. I don't even remember what that was all about. It was so stupid. Oh, your galactic readiness. That yeah, was it. Yeah, galactic readiness. <laughs> so it's like you had to fuck it. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't even remember what the fucking mechanic was. But you it had was to stupid. like play multiplayer matches and then like build up a oh, bar yeah. so then you'd be ready to it's like If you want your single player campaign to be good, like it's going to fail unless you do this online bullshit. <laughs> yeah, basically. And then they also did the day one DLC for the fucking Protheon. <laughs> yeah. That I pre-ordered yeah. Mass Effect 3 and I got like the, obviously the day one DLC with it because I was already going to just like get everything for it. And when I was playing through the game and I got to the part where there was the Protheans, this alien race that is literally like the first two games, they're like Protheans, Protheans, but like they're talking about the entire backstory of everything that's happening. It is super important, like this, this super important to the fucking story. And then I realized after I play that part that what I had just played was the day one DLC. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. This seems like essential this is like really important to the story this is like what they've been talking about yeah. the previous two games <laughs> and then it, obviously it yeah. you know come to find out it's like oh it's day one dlc because ea literally just removed a chunk of the game and decided to put on a 10 20 price tag onto it and be like yeah. no this is dlc when it never was supposed to be dlc yeah so disgusting so that character doesn't have like proper integration into the story as well yeah. like it's mm -hmm. clearly not as yeah it, it, that, i remember finding that so frustrating because yeah. he was like a cool character Fucking disgusting. cool voice and everything javik yeah that's right yeah. can't wait for the remaster yeah that's sick my brother told me a couple of days ago that the first game he had ever pre-ordered was cyberpunk 2077 <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn, I learned a hell of a lesson. <laughs> yeah, hopefully he learns from it. <laughs> anyway, that's our rant about the video game industry. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. great.
I don't mind talking about that. It's fun. No, I, I love talking about video games. Yeah. We'll see. We'll yeah, see what yeah, happens in the yeah. future. Hopefully, things aren't as predatory. Support indie developers. Support indie developers. Jonathan Blow, Toby mm -hmm. Fox. I actually like the the Dead Space Three co op though. I actually enjoyed that. I guess sometimes it could lead to like good kind of mechanics in a game. Sometimes, um, but mostly EA is pretty predatory. Yeah, and garbage. Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah. yeah i just don't want to be like fuck capitalism uh, like i'm a sheep or something but yeah sometimes i feel like ea they've been voted like the worst company of all time yeah it was like, like four years, years in, a in a row or something yeah yeah <laughs> it's like they should stop being kind of assholes and realize like yeah there's a balance you know make money people want to support you but also you know don't don't fuck exploit people and i feel like that's what and, they're like, doing destroy game companies literally shut mm -hmm. buy them and shut them down literally yeah like the battlefield franchise is it's inconsistent, but I Dead feel like the most dead. part, it's got a lot of potential. Yeah, but they, you know, they like pump out a game every two years. Hardline is terrible. Yeah, mm -hmm. the new Battlefield is terrible. The last one had like a Force Battle Royale thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was bad. Battlefield Five. Yeah. yeah, that was bad. But you know, they got some good ones in there too. <laughs> it's wasted potential. So we all saw a film that is kind of also a series mm -hmm. called Small Axe. It's like a and, bunch of films. Yeah, it's like five <laughs> yeah. Yeah. films, and they're all by Steve McQueen, the better one, <laughs> my second favorite director. <laughs> He's a director, yeah. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot of top 10 lists of the year 2020, and uh, two of these wound up making them onto a lot of people's top 10 lists. Mangrove and Lovers Rock. Mangrove, I really understand. Lovers Rock, I kind of get that being on top ten list, but I found it weird just being like, "Whoa, that's really above Mangrove." Like, anyway, what did you guys think of the series? I think Ralph, you didn't watch all of them, but I watched uh, Mangrove, but that's the only one. Yeah, that's the important. Yeah, one, I though. finished it up today. Yeah, I would say there were three real standouts to me. Mm -hmm. That being Mangrove, the one with John Boyega, and. Uh, education oh yeah um yeah i i just yeah i really liked that one in particular i just thought the whole series did a really good job of exploring quite a delicate subject and really kind of emphasizing mostly the just how difficult it is to fight any kind of systematic kind of oppression just mm -hmm. really what that entails and how that affects so many different parts of like life whether it be you know, the first episode is just about a guy trying to run a restaurant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the the John Boyega trying to be a cop. Mm -hmm. and, and it's all set in London, of course, and uh, in period pieces from like the 60s to 80s. So that aspect of it, the second and third generation immigrants and everything and the way they were kind of depicted, I, I love all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it, it just has a really well-rounded kind of approach to the topic. And of course, Steve McQueen's direction is... Is very impressive. Mm -hmm. The writing too is really good. It's just it has all the hooks I, it needs. I love Steve McQueen. Yeah, well, the the direction and the colors and everything it is. Yeah. It was really enjoyable. I was like expecting there to be like a couple weaker episodes, or that Mangrove was going to be the main focus. But I actually thought most episodes were pretty stellar mm -hmm. in terms of stuff like yeah. released recently. It's very ambitious yeah. for him to make like five movies or whatever, if whatever it is, mm -hmm. <laughs> like in mm -hmm. one kind of yeah. package. Yeah, I love Shame. I think Shame's probably one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So, like, all of his movies are fucking great. So, yeah, I got a lot out of just the way it's executed and the directing. And, yeah, the acting's pretty great. Yeah, he's got one I haven't seen. Okay, neither of mm -hmm. you have seen Hunger, right? No. Yeah, okay. Hunger's the one I need to see. Cool. Yeah, I totally want to see it. I heard there's, like, a famous long take in it. Oh, of course, so. yeah. Sounds interesting. Oh, it's great. Obviously, the directing is, like, one of the best standout parts to this series for me. Mm -hmm. Like, I really love just his, the creative way that he expresses himself, and I love that he is, like, really obviously ballsy and confident about the way that he approaches, like, visual storytelling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every single one of his films that I can think of, there's always one, at least one, shot in there that's, like, really different and you know, usually kind of like a mm -hmm. long one or take where it's like, okay, yeah, you're you're pushing this past the point where other directors would and it's working out because you're doing it differently. 
so like in 12 years a slave it's you know the yeah. one long shot that's i'm not going to spoil but like really long uncomfortable <laughs> like like wow this is still going mm-hmm. great like no music like it's really obvious like why it's still going it's like okay you're supposed to be there in the moment right like this is yeah you know, this is this is not yeah, dramatic yeah, yeah, sized yeah. anymore this is like raw right mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot of stuff like that in hunger and uh yeah it, watching this series i am happy that it is something that is patient it is something that is like unique Mm. and different i still think mangrove works the best overall out of like each of these episodes it feels the most appropriate for its length also like it's like two hours but it doesn't feel like slow or you know unjustified for its length whereas a lot of the one hour like every other one is one hour so from episode two three four Mm. and five or each one hour i feel like a lot of those probably could have been trimmed down either to like 30 or 40 minutes. Lovers mm-hmm. Rock in particular, as much as I love the vibe, as much as I'm like so into what's going on and the energy and like, you know, it's just, it's it's an infectious energy for, for that episode. Like that's the yeah. whole point of it. But I feel like it, you know, the same energy can be communicated in half an hour, not an hour, because it does start <laughs> to feel like really like, oh, okay, this is, this is like the whole thing, isn't it? You know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I was more just thrown off by I, I didn't realize it was going to be so different because mm-hmm. Lovers Rock is so different to Mangrove, which oh, is yeah. really like about that court case. It has like a real like structure in that way. So I wasn't I was a bit thrown off by how kind of varied the series is in that way. But I also really liked that about it. Actually, I liked that y- you get your like really serious like specific this is this person their story how that like the clashes in london and the political side of it Mm -hmm. but then you do get like the lover's rock where it's more about the just what it was like at the time you know a mood piece setting the scene and kind of like letting you live in it for a bit so you can actually understand exactly yeah true it was being talked about you know yeah i'll watch that one next i guess Mm -hmm. lover's rock yeah, I would I would say for all but Mangrove, you have to. It, it's best going into them like understanding that you do have to be like somewhat patient with it. Like expect something really really slow, <laughs> which I sure. don't have a huge issue with. But it's like because of it, I wouldn't really recommend it to everybody. I would recommend Mangrove mm-hmm. to like pretty much almost everybody, but like the rest of them, I'd be like only people that I know like have <laughs> a good amount of patience and can appreciate right, something yeah. just like i guess for the technical filmmaking elements of just like oh wow this is all like really well shot throughout i love the energy love the sound design you know great acting but might not the performances yeah too, the yeah. performances but might not need i guess like a really structured traditional narrative sort of thing going on you know yeah um i honestly the only one where i I've, I've, I've felt the length was lover's rock which is, you know, I I did also see yeah. it was the one being very understandable. Yeah. Um. So I was almost like wondering what I was missing until it finished, and I kind of figured what it was going for. But mm-hmm. as I say, with the different episodes and the the different goals, I was I was a bit confused at first. But mm-hmm. I'll have to rewatch that one. But as far as the other ones, though, I I I thought they were quite succinct in the way they went through. And I guess yeah, it is obviously like mostly talking like drama. But I guess that's the appeal of stuff like this. I. There's just like those of really understandable, relatable like characters like John Biega in Red, White and Blue. Mm-hmm. And he's got this really interesting like relationship with his dad, who's like never bring cops around here and he like well, I mm-hmm. guess it's kind of spoilers a little bit, but he like keeps it a secret mm-hmm. from his dad and obviously the the chaos that comes from that. There's, each episode has those hooks, as I said earlier. Uh, but they're all so different from each other it does give like a really wide view of this this time period it's just it is a really ambitious project because then you do have like the quiet like education episode which is about an essential part that people forget oh, yeah. about like how important education is it's like really key yeah, it's like not as blatantly i guess like it, it's not as blatant in what people would expect to be covered by the series i guess yeah, yeah, and I think because it is set in the UK, like seeing the schools and everything, and the just the devil in the details mm-hmm. and all the mise en scene they put on the walls and everything, it all just felt very like genuine and accurate, and like it was just trying to portray like real grief mm-hmm. without hamming it up or anything. It's just very real mm-hmm. in that way. So with this and like Twelve Years a Slave, I 
I'm kind of like, I would love to hear Steve McQueen like talk about his own experiences growing up. Yeah. It seems like, I mean, like if he, you know, this is like a few in a row now, or I guess there was widows in between, but, Mm -hmm. you know, like it seems like he would obviously have some sort of, you know, personal experience that he's attached to because this is clearly a subject that he's really passionate Mm. about. Yeah, and clearly a ton of research went in as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's very genuine, especially with the dialect, too. I was really impressed. Yes, and all the accents and everything. Yeah, yeah. Although I'm not like an expert on the dialect, but you know, it it seemed genuine enough to me from a person that obviously is just a Canadian white dude. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Needed subtitles. That was a really cool detail, actually. Yeah, there's all sorts of different accents because London's such a mixing pot. So yeah, that was a cool detail I noted down too. Mm Hmm. Yeah, I also noticed because I had the subtitles on, there were a lot of, in every single episode, there were a lot of um, moments where the subtitle would say, like, sucks teeth, and the character would, would go, like, or whatever. And I was wondering if that was, like, I'm, right. I'm, like, I would have to assume that that was, like, a, like a bit of a, like, a cultural sort of thing, like, more often than... Yeah, I'm not sure. I wanted to have subtitles on, but on iTunes, it wouldn't let oh, me. Really? Reason, so. Oh, really? Yeah, it really annoyed me. That sucks. Yeah, it was on... Uh, Amazon Prime in the US and then like a week or two after they released it on Amazon Prime in Canada but I guess it's just BBC in the UK. Yeah, and you've got to have like a TV license to watch BBC. That's which stupid. I don't have so I like buy it on iTunes. You have a license for that TV? <laughs> it's so stu- oh god it's so dumb. <laughs> they like send someone to your house. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I'm really blown away just by like how he captures things visually. Every single time I'm watching one of his films, like whether or not the camera is stationary or whether or not it's like moving, you know, like handheld, it's like every single moment of it, it's like I can feel that whoever's operating the camera feels what's in the scene, you know, like yeah, they feel the yeah. emotions there. They're adding to the emotions. Like there's something genuine in the visual storytelling with Steve McQueen movies all the time. Mm-hmm. And it always yeah. just kind of blows me away. Yeah, he like knows when to hold on a on a face mm-hmm. and like really just take in like the emotion or, or expression of what the actor's mm-hmm. doing. Like that's really that really comes through. Yeah, yeah. In Mangrove, there's like the shot in the reflection of like the rain spattered car when um, Letitia Wright is mm-hmm. on the megaphone. I think it was her. Mm-hmm. There was like later in the courtroom where it was just like. There's this scene going on, but you just see like under the table of like people's shoes and stuff. I just love like little kind of like creative yeah. ways of of showing things where it's like there's too many directors that that walk into a set and just think of the scene of like, okay, well, these characters are talking. I'm going to show these characters, you know, just like a like a B, a B, maybe a wide shot, go on, whatever. But Steve McQueen always finds like these like really unique ways of of covering a scene where it's just like okay like he actually put some thought into it or some like emotion into it it doesn't even seem like calculated to the point where like i don't even know if he storyboarded it or if he just showed up and was like you know what i feel like we should go in (laughs) to like the rain spattered car here and and do this or like go under the table Mm -hmm. sort of thing like it might just be Mm -hmm. like more impulsive i don't know but whatever it is he does it the fact you can't tell means it works yeah exactly yeah, there's like a, a moment in the education episode where the the young boy is he's waiting for his sister like in the bathroom, like he's just desperate to get in there and she won't let him in that typical kind of oh, yeah. sibling way. And he like starts running down the stairs to tell his mum and then that's when she comes out. I just there's loads of nice little homely details like that that really mm-hmm. like make you settle in mm-hmm. to the mood of it. You just reminded me of um the shot, which I'm not really going to spoil, but let's just say one of the characters is like lying down in a restrained position and it just goes on for like so long. Yes, yeah. And then there's another shot that's like nearly identical that's in a completely different situation and it's reincorporated later. And just like, if you think about those two shots, you're really, you're saying a lot about the situation without spoiling it. It's like, you're saying yeah, so much about like the systemic version or the systemic nature of what's being expressed in this series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was episode four, wasn't it? Which had some cool stuff in it. Oh, yeah, and that I was four. I especially four. liked yeah. the... That was the one that ended, but there was like a... Yeah. a like a poem with this, this slideshow of pictures and stuff. I thought that was that was pretty powerful. And like a, his advice in the, in the cell of 
you know, like reading and educating yourself is like so important and that you you can't really choose your future if you don't know your past kind of stuff and mm -hmm. yeah just lots of thoughtful ideas in there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i like the cast a lot of mangrove anyway there's like uh leticia wright who's mm -hmm. in black panther so everyone knows her but there's a lot of like unknown actors like uh a lot of i don't want to say no names but people who you don't see as much <laughs> maybe and they were more present yeah. in that movie that i thought yeah it was, it was cool to see like a bunch of actors i didn't recognize i feel like if this was a bigger studio production they were throwing a lot of big name actors and that might have taken me out of it a little i don't know yeah no i agree i like the villains of mangrove too they were just like completely unredeemable pieces of garbage like yeah. The, yeah to the point where it was like yeah. sometimes cartoonish but i mean like not to say that those characters wouldn't exist but... yeah but also you know that's that's the way it was i mean it was horrible yeah yeah, yeah exactly they were just pieces of shit there's yeah. just no reason for that kind of racism yeah exactly but, yeah uh, they were well played like the actors who played mm. them were really good yeah. man i was so impressed by leticia wright because like black panther doesn't really give somebody that much <laughs> to, to work with <laughs> yeah, but yeah, i was I like was too i thought she was really good yeah she yeah, was awesome exactly and then she mm. went on some crazy fucking religious anti-vex rant and deleted her social media but yeah, whatever <laughs> oh nice good acting, i didn't know about that Wow, yeah. really? All right. good acting. Yeah, she did her job. <laughs> <laughs> She's a religious nut. <laughs> good actor, though. Good acting. Yeah, sure. Yeah, everyone's on their A-game, obviously, when they're put on a project like this. I really loved the characters in it. I think that every episode had some characters, at least, that were like really relatable and really memorable, mm -hmm. and like their goals were really clear sort of thing. Yeah. It was all like... In terms of characters, especially, it was all really watchable. Like I said earlier, I do wish that some were half an hour long and not an hour long. I think that would have helped it for me, but still, very mm. ambitious. Yes. It is a big time investment, which yeah. is why I haven't watched all of them yet. But I will eventually. They sound interesting. It's a big time investment to watch, but also a big time investment to film. I wonder how he filmed it. I wonder if he yeah, took the same yeah. approach that he did with like all of his f other like actual films or if he treated these more like like a rushed schedule sort of thing. Like I wonder what the budget was for all of these. It doesn't feel rushed as a thing. Oh yeah, would I mean it could have been rushed without feeling yeah. rushed. Like if someone's like mm -hmm. just that talented of a director, yeah. they know, you know. Do you think that's why Mangrove so much longer? You just got tired. <laughs> No, I think, I mean, it's the pilot. Usually, like, tons of series will have, like, pilot episode is longer sort of thing. Even BBC was advertising this as, like, five new films from Steve McQueen. So, I mean, I think the pilot was longer just because it was a better story than the other ones. And there was more justification to make it, like, an entire film. Yeah. And, yeah, I think, like, even if it was released as a an actual film in the same way that, uh, what was that fucking uh, Sorkin one? Mangrove probably would would have been like really well received. Like there were enough people that liked that Aaron Sorkin courtroom thing <laughs> that came out at a very similar point in time. I didn't bother that with recent? that one though. Yeah, I didn't even see that. Trial of the Chicago Seven, I think it's called. Oh, I didn't I didn't know we wrote that. Yeah, written and directed Aaron Sorkin. Wow. We've got Sasha Baron Cohen, Eddie Redmayne. It just like I saw the trailer and I was like, ah, eh, this looks like too many other <laughs> one of these you know and then i read some articles <laughs> later which who knows maybe you know i haven't seen the movie so it might just be full of shit but i read some articles later just being like mangrove succeeded where trial of the chicago seven failed sort of thing and i don't know a lot of yeah. my watchers people in my twitch chat were saying it was like kind of cheesy formulated sort of thing it just like it gives me the overwhelming impression mm -hmm. of like an oscar Beatty movie yeah. whereas mangrove doesn't feel that way like it feels more like a soulful passion project sort of thing i don't know but yeah i haven't seen chicago yeah. 7 i guess i'll watch it before the oscars because it's probably going to get nominated for something oh yeah the oscars yeah <laughs> yeah those are even more relevant this year well yeah. now it's like there was this <laughs> yeah. whole i guess we're done talking about small acts right what are we giving it i'm giving mangrove an eight out of ten yeah i would rate mangrove four out of five or eight out of ten yeah yeah, I, I I think I rated every episode a, a four star, mm -hmm. an eight out of ten. I, yeah, I really enjoyed the experience, got a lot out of it. Yeah, not uh, I don't have as strong of a 
opinion on my rating on the rest of them. Um, I would just say overall series is like seven or an eight, but Mangrove specifically, at least it's it's a pretty comfortable eight. Might be higher next time I watch it, but yeah, it'll probably make my best of the year list. Anyway, yeah, mm. the Oscars. <laughs> hey, what are they doing? This will this will be like the first year where like they're basically forced to nominate only streaming movies. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, which is like, kind of cool. They were trying so hard beforehand to like not legitimize streaming services, and now it's like suck on it, Steven Spielberg. Fuck you. So it's still happening then. I guess yeah. they just assumed they'd they'd cancelled it. No, no, no. Um, like six at least six months ago, it was like. So early in the pandemic, even it might have been even earlier. It might have been like fucking March of last year. I don't remember. But at some point in 2020, they made an announcement saying that the Oscars would still be happening, but they would delay it until I think April instead of usually the Oscars would take place in, I think, February, March. So the Oscars are taking place like at the end of April or something. I don't remember the exact date, but what really pisses me off about it is they were like, yeah, and we're also extending the eligibility by like two months. So movies released in like February and March of 2021 will be eligible for the 2020 Oscars, which I think is fucking stupid and bullshit because even if like, yeah, whatever, there were a bunch of like big budget Marvel movies that had to get pushed back and stuff due to the pandemic, like or even some Oscar baity like studio things like there is no shortage of really great movies that came out in 2020. Like there's still lots of great fucking shit, you know, and this was evident like even as far back as when they announced that they would be extending the eligibility for the Oscars. So I'm really pissed off about that because like it really just shows that they're not aware <laughs> of these smaller movies that are yeah. like coming out yeah, they just or don't that they mm-hmm. don't want to give them like legitimacy, <laughs> right? That they have to play yeah. the fucking game and have, you know, a big studio campaign for your consideration like fucking Disney does. Like yeah. What's wi- going to wind up happening is like Soul's going to get nominated for like Best Picture because they'll be like, well, there were just no other movies that came out. Bah, bah, bah. And they'll pretend like it was justified. <laughs> but that really pisses me off because there was tons of mm-hmm. great stuff in 2020. We just have to like be somebody that's passionate about movies, which the Academy apparently isn't. Yeah, if you want to win an Academy Award, you need an Oscar campaign, which it's costs so a lot of money. Yeah. And it's usually Warner Brothers or Disney who can afford that kind of thing mm-hmm. and not the small studios. So they never get anything. And that's why it's like, I don't want to say it's rigged, but it's it's bullshit. It's not the real best movie of the year. And it and this kind of shows there's, it. There's a barrier. Yeah. Everything's like, like a, that. Every awards thing. It's gatekeeping. Thing. Yeah. They're like, out of these movies that are made within the system, this is the best one. Mm-hmm. But not out of the <laughs> yeah. That's year. exactly how it feels. <laughs> yeah, it's a system. I was looking at the um, submission guidelines for the um, Juno Awards, so like Canadian equivalent of the Grammys. And I don't watch them. I'm not like super familiar with them. Like I don't know. I was thinking like, okay, I released an album. You know, I have somewhat of an online following. Maybe you know, if I include that kind of stuff, then I could be considered for like a best new artist nomination or something. You know, it's Canada and like Mm. there aren't that a lot Mm. of things coming out anyway. But then when I was looking through like the actual application process, there are just so many things where it's just like, here's the spot for your like agent and your publicist. But like, it's like they didn't even consider that somebody could be making music that doesn't have an agent or publicist or anything. It's just like, why is there no option for none? It's like, this is really just a fucking club. And I was like kind of disappointing just to see like, yeah, even in even for the fucking Juno Awards, this is like some bullshit thing. You know? Yeah, I'm not trying to say like, oh yeah, I deserve the fucking Juno Award. It was just like you know, yeah, like how are you supposed to get a credibility if you don't have an agent? But to get an agent, you need credibility. To, yeah, like, sort get, of thing. To get yeah. a good one. <laughs> yeah, so it's like a. It's like you just have to. It's hard. Apply for an agent and get exploited ninety percent of the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's basically mm-hmm. it. Yeah, and hopefully in the long run you'll make money. Yeah, yeah, it's a horrible circle joke. Yeah, it's a really annoying system that's set up that really just prioritizes and favors like these. It's the same thing with like YouTube, you know, like you're on a network and you have mm-hmm. you know, more commu- lines of communication with uh, YouTube as a platform. It's like they just don't like the idea of individual users. And I guess it's just the same thing with any sort of arts or entertainment, big business mm-hmm. sort of thing. You always have to go through middlemen. Yeah, it becomes an illustrious club. Yeah. Yeah, especially. Really annoying. So we also saw another film. It was my recommendation called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. 
and I already forget the French title. It was like Le Chandre Papillon or something like that. Yeah. The film is directed by Julian Schnabel. And the reason why I didn't do a an attempt at a French accent when reading his name is because uh, he actually learned French to make the film. Oh, wow. Is that uh, it was supposed to be an American film first, and he decided, no, this is a French story. I want to tell it in French. Obviously, from the source material being French, he decided the French language, there was so much poetically going into it that he, you know, it, it would do it justice if it was in the language that the story was actually told in. Yeah, that's really good. Anyway, this is one of my yeah. favorite movies. I watch it every so often. And... uh Mm-hmm. What did you two think of it, first-time watchers? Alex, I don't know what you thought of it. Yeah, it's, it's very impressive. I thought it was very, very good. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was very good. I really enjoyed it a lot. Spoiler discussion. Yeah, spoiler discussion. I heard about this film before from just the opening scene, or the mm-hmm. opening first 10 minutes, where it's kind of told from the main character's point of view, like first person. And there's this really interesting effect they do where he's like kind of fading in and out of consciousness, mm-hmm. you know, and there's this like distortion of the lens almost. And that's yeah. accomplished by um, like they kind of lock when you when you put a lens on a camera, you got to like lock it into place. Yeah, they like but they kind of they kind of like just hovered it over the sensor. Mm-hmm. So there's this distortion that uh, makes it feel like yeah. very. Yeah. And then we learned that I learned about this in, in school and they show the scene because it's like one of the most. I think effective examples of it. Mm-hmm. It is very effective, like the way they put you in this guy's perspective and yeah, it's incredibly purposeful. Yeah, and I think the first twenty minutes of this movie was like absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and once it gets into the more, it's definitely more kind of conventional. The the rest yeah. of the story, how it's told, but I still really enjoyed it. I just think it's the first twenty minutes that were really. Stellar. It's hard to beat. <laughs> yeah, it's a really high bar. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's so creative. Yeah, it really really does put you in his perspective, and it's so like claustrophobic and the narration and everything. It is just such a creative like minimalist way of doing. A sequence like that yeah. or an idea like that like following through on an idea like that because you say it's quite illuminating you saying about the 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 director learning french and everything and, and really committing to the mm-hmm. story and everything because i was shocked that it was based on a real person yeah um, i yeah. somehow missed that i did like no research before watching the yeah. end of the credits it's like oh yeah yeah so i was because i assumed it was like uh you know it was fictional yeah i wasn't it. super aware of like the yeah. story or the book before watching it either so it's like yeah yeah uh, i i kept thinking this could be one of those stories that could be really hollywood and lame and they almost mock it in in that scene where he's saying about like like because he's a writer himself Mm -hmm. so he says like i I thought of an ending where he's like i wake up in my bed but it was all a dream (laughs) and he Mm -hmm. says to oh fuck (laughs) like this kind of idea because that that in like the early sections of the movie i'm always like thinking like how based on what they've set up in like this first act how is this going to conclude and i always have like the worst idea of like the worst possible ending and like him <laughs> doing that would be yeah. like, the worst ending so i thought that was that was funny that it came up they also had like kind of moments in the editing where they were kind of mocking that sort of thing where it's mm-hmm. like the um yeah like the uh, that song that was playing is like don't kiss me goodbye baby and they, it was just like this like really sappy ish kind of like almost mm-hmm. it, it seemed like it was going to go into like a montage and conclude but then it's just like hard cut back to reality and then it's just you know it's like yeah the hard oh, cuts this is awesome. this is this is like horrendously depressing <laughs> oh oops this is life mm-hmm. oh there goes gravity yeah it's a very interesting film considering the main character doesn't move or talk oh yeah <laughs> for for most of it <laughs> And yeah, that's pretty impressive too. Uh, the filmmaking techniques he used mm-hmm. to keep it interesting. Yeah, and also, also like the performance that goes into that when you're limited <laughs> to pretty mm-hmm. much just like moving your eye is like yeah. the amount of expression that you're limited yeah, to. Yeah, just doing narration. And uh, Matthew Emmerich really pulls it off. Like you can yeah. tell. Like there's a moment in the um, when his father calls him. And he realizes that that's who's calling. Like you can see in his eye that he's like really upset and like emotionally like stabbed by it in a way where like he wasn't ready for it. And you can tell he's like trying not to cry despite the limitations of what he's able to show as an actor. But you can see it perfectly. And I think that's really impressive. Yeah, that was Mm -hmm. a great scene. The phone call, Mm -hmm. like not knowing how to handle 
communicating with him because and you don't even get much time really with his dad it's only mm-hmm. like the shaving scene earlier on but that's all you need like yeah. the, the actors really carry it through that and just <laughs> it's such an extreme scenario mm-hmm. like it has it's so much innate emotion there's so much drama in there um so i was reading the 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 main change that was made to the story apparently from the real life one is that the the woman who was by his side was was more so his his lover as as opposed to the the mother of his child so i think mm. in, in reality those roles were switched a bit more oh um, yeah I, I think the reason they did that is because i guess it does add for the drama and that mm-hmm. payoff scene in terms of like the emotional resonance of it where he's his the the the, the mother of his children has to like translate his blinking into like a love message yeah yeah <laughs> Which is like so, it's pretty heavy stuff yeah. like going on in this movie. The interplay between the characters, like it is just a, he's like an illustrious man. Everyone loves him, and then it is just one day everything's kind of taken away from him, and, and his inner realization of that. That's what I love about the narration in it, mm. and and him being a writer too, so mm-hmm. you can have the that kind that kind of dialogue, you know, the, yeah. the writer's voice where he's so necessary. Yeah, exactly. A film like this makes you appreciate like your life. Like, oh, I can move, I can walk, I can yeah. <laughs> do all these amazing yeah, things. Yeah. And I think that's the that's the point of the story in some way. It makes you appreciate your own life. Yeah. Yeah, you don't know what you have until you lose it, mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it isn't I, I was actually thinking like if this scenario of locked in syndrome and being able to like blink or, or just move one eye and that's it. If this had happened to somebody, let's say current year there would probably be a better range of more efficient communication because of yeah, technology because that. we have we have eye tracking now <laughs> so you could literally mm-hmm. just set up a like he could yeah. probably be typing out messages independently just by looking at certain places on a keyboard like a you know on a screen or something cuz eye tracking exists so why not but like going mm-hmm. through that process of i don't really remember when it was set but obviously probably around the year 2000 or something, something like that. I don't remember. Yeah. I'd have to look up the actual event. But anyway, yeah, the limitations of, you know, needing somebody to be by your side dictating what you're trying to say and just going through the letters of the alphabet in in order of the frequency of use, which is also clever how they were doing that. And I love also that they were touched on like, the proper and improper ways to do it like his friend shows up and he's like oh you're not even looking at me and you know yeah the person yeah. that's hired on to do it for his book you can tell that she's reading it slower as she's starting out than the speech therapist that was working with him earlier you know at this point in the movie she's like uh, out uh, like bam 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 like she does it so many times she's comfortable with it i love that they touched on that in terms of like what's practically happening for this character yeah. Yeah, it also gets you in with just the little details, like the fly on the nose. Mm. And... That was uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the the things that pop into your mind when you empathize with a character like this and imagine yourself in their shoes, like is it is horrifying. But that was another thing I found kind of impressive about it was the way it was able to balance that tone because it is such a such a bleak story. Mm-hmm. But through the personality of the characters and through that narration, it's able to. I don't know. It's weirdly inspiring, and in, in in that way, like I, I didn't come away like heartbroken and yeah. like I'd had something wrenched from me. It was it gave me a different perspective, if anything. There are funny points for sure. There's yeah. a lot of yeah, yeah. relief in the movie, yeah, that I enjoyed. And he's also like, I love <laughs> they kind of give him like this kind of like pervy character too. You know, like <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much yeah. of this was like <laughs> in his in the real person's book, right? So maybe like there was a mm-hmm. bit of that kind of like cheekiness, also. Yeah, you never know if that. Well, I mean, you could know just by reading the book, but I ain't got time for that. So <laughs> I don't know how much of that <laughs> is true from yeah. the actual real life character versus like what they put in the film. It's, yeah, it's also reinforced a bit too in in the the dad scene with the shaving. Yeah. They're talking about the the escapades. Mm-hmm. Aren't they with the lovers? Yeah, all their affairs they've had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. A big conflict in his life was like all the relationships he had with these different women, mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah, the drama was only escalated by the the tragedy. I will say that one criticism I do have of the film is that the amount of women in his life, these characters, a lot of them look kind of similar. And so if this is like your first time watching it, it's like a bit more confusing. I don't know if you guys felt that way at all, 
but I feel like there was a lot going on. Like there's there's a lot of these characters and they all have like very Yeah, I did feel that. But... Maybe. But I also felt that was kind of the point. Like maybe that was his type. The the film doesn't like super explicitly like hammer down what exactly each one of their relationships is like in a super clear way. Like you kind of have to sure. like, figure it out by watching at some points, but or just like, you know, paying more attention. Mm -hmm. Did did you feel the same way too? I guess. Yeah. In some way. Yeah. It, there's definitely a lot of conflict going on with the with the women in his life. Mm -hmm. I didn't take it as pervy as much as like, you know, he was a uh, a man locked in his body and all these like sexual urges he had like couldn't be fulfilled mm -hmm. and i found it quite funny like you know the, yeah, he just yeah, couldn't ever you. continue <laughs> with these uh mm -hmm. kind of romantic relationships he had it would only it would only go to a certain point mm -hmm. this was left in the the question thread but mm -hmm. I, I won't ask the question associated for it but it's just an observation by uh, assad a basic lurker said the diving bell in the butterfly has very specific instances of green and blue that visually express the main character's mindset. Green will often reflect moments of positivity and healing, while blue seems to demonstrate moments of negativity, distress, confusion, or apprehension. The main metaphor in the film is that of a diving bell sinking to the bottom of the sea, with mm -hmm. the main character trapped inside. As it follows, water, especially in large bodies, can tend to be greener towards the surface by virtue of sunlight and darker blues as you get further into the depths. Mm -hmm. I'm totally mm -hmm. over the moon that you guys are talking about this film. And it, yeah, it, do, it is a really interesting in the way it use the, uses the colors yeah. to, to accentuate totally. the, that claustrophobic feel. That's why they got the icebergs too. Yeah, yeah, exactly too. Mm. That too. Yeah, I just thought that was a nice uh, comment. Yeah, the icebergs were cool. I love the way the film ended too. Mm -hmm. like, I know it's, uh, it was just very sudden. Yeah, they're reversing. Mm -hmm. And the yeah, the reversing of the iceberg footage, and just the way it just kind of stopped. Yeah, like, Ooh, yeah. You don't need much more <laughs> at that point because yeah. like you don't want right. to force yeah. it to go into a direction that would be. Really but it lame. leaves you wanting more. You're like, oh, that's it, and and that's that's a good feeling, I think. Then like, will this fucking end already? <laughs> like you know, ten minutes before the movie's <laughs> yeah. over. <laughs> yeah, I really liked the score oh. and the music choices for the soundtrack too. I feel like it yeah, was all really appropriate. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the credit song. That was one I already knew. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I chose Strummer. Mm. Do you think there was much reason for those song choices? Because some of them I weren't too crazy about. Some of them were mm -hmm. kind of cool. But... Um, I don't know. I just I, I felt like it was fitting. I felt like it was appropriate for the most part. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Nothing really like took yeah. me out in terms of the song choices. I feel like the like the opening scene, The I don't know if the song is just called La Mer. Or whatever it is, but like mm -hmm. that, like super old, especially with the visuals of the opening titles, of just like really, it kind of mm -hmm. gave me like mm -hmm. an uncomfortable, almost like how Lars von Trier does his opening title sequences sometimes, you know? Sure. Where it was just like kind of like eerie and creepy, which I kind of like. Mm -hmm. I really like juxtaposed emotions in a way where it's like the song is kind of, you know, yeah, a little, on its yeah. own, the song is like kind of like a little happy ish, you know, there's nothing sad about the mm -hmm. song, but. Just because of how it's used, it's you know there's there's some mm -hmm. negative emotion to it that's kind of brought out by it existing at the same time. If that yeah. makes sense, mm -hmm. it, it makes sense. I always felt like I was locked in his experience, even when the camera mm -hmm. wasn't directly his POV. Mm -hmm. And like even the music choices, I felt like it was his kind of imagination. What they make a they make a point of his imagination. Oh yeah, like just kind of filling in the soundtrack for his own movie with songs he likes, you know. And in that way, I th I thought the, the song choices were appropriate. True. Like every kind of element of the movie was his kind of journey. Mm -hmm. So as we were saying, like the first twenty minutes of this film are like really hard to beat. <laughs> like the first act. Um, <laughs> it's a great like short oh, film it's awesome, in and of yeah. itself. But yeah. I wonder, like, if let's say. If let's say somebody wanted to make the entire movie like that, I wonder what that would be like, <laughs> you know? It might be a bit much. It's like Enter the Void. Yeah, would it, well, like it, here's the question is, <laughs> would it be too much by the end of it, I guess? Or like, how would they do a lot of like practical Maybe. things? Maybe. Enter the Void's a good example to bring up, I guess. But I mean, you're also like kind of omniscient in that movie too. Weirdly enough. Um... Yeah, that movie gets very trippy. <laughs> The British sitcom Peep Show. Oh yeah, it, like the gimmick of the show is that it's from the perspective of like the characters, so they have like a camera strapped to their head, 
so it was weirdly reminding me of that at first but th that was like a problem with the first season of that show it's like a kind of out there idea so it did feel a bit much because every yeah. every episode like every shot was like a point of view from the characters shot like strapped to their heads so yeah i, I don't know if it would really work filling it out for the whole movie i, I actually love the way it like broke up the pace mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going to different scenes and the the variation of stuff real great like showing instead of telling with all those kind of dreams and descriptions of things it's yeah mm -hmm. really made mm -hmm. the most of it yeah it was very very poetic overall and also really really great editing this is one of those where mm -hmm. it's like the editing is mm -hmm. also like super noticeable, but it's like it works for what it's doing. Yeah. You know, like as I mentioned before, like there are a few points where like the music does like the hard cut, which I really like, especially for this type of film. Yeah. Yeah. It's trying to balance these different emotions. Oh, yeah. There was that uh, really great transition where um, he blinked for yes when he was learning like the yes and no commands from his perspective. And it, like the the blink covers the screen. And then when the eye opens, it's like. He was answering the question, are you the editor for the magazine L? And he blinked once for yes, and then the eyelid opens, and then it's like from behind his head in the past now, and it goes into that scene where he's like, yes, yeah. I was the, you know, now it's a flashback for him as the editor for the magazine L. It's like, that was not only very creative in terms of how it was done visually, but like at that moment in the story also, where it's like, oh, you're transitioning. This is his memory. You know, like we are still inside his head technically, kind yeah. of, you know. Yeah. yeah. That's a yeah. good point. Really, really mm. purposeful and well thought out. Totally. Yeah. How did they do the shot with the doctor sewing up the eye? Oh, that's just like a. <laughs> oh, yeah. That they was used sick. Like, a, like a prosthetic. Yeah, prosthetic. You know, something looks, <laughs> looks like an eyelid or whatever. Yeah, I loved that. It was yeah. really, really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was awesome. It's like it's like really grody in a way. It's like really uncomfortable, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... that's a good thing that's because what makes like it work, you though. want to, you know, the film wants to communicate how this person felt as these things were happening, right? And that must have been terrifying. That must have been really gross and just like super uncomfortable, yeah. especially with him not being able to communicate that he didn't want this to happen. But you know, unfortunately, that was a necessity. Otherwise, the eye would just like fucking dry out and get infected. You know, they had to close it up. It wasn't receiving any kind mm -hmm. of like muscle commands from the brain. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and just the tactical way they kind of avoid showing the main character's face for such a long time. It's these extreme close ups on his eyes. I was eyes. just about to say that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is that what you were going to say? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I really liked that. And I, I did too. Because it starts like a, you know nothing, you absolutely mm -hmm. know nothing. But by the end, you know everything about this guy. Yeah, like basically everything he's done in his life, all of his biggest relationships, his kids, and everything. Mm -hmm. the, the event itself, how it goes down, it it does get broader. It's awesome, and you get to experience the reveal of his face with him because he doesn't know what his face looks like mm -hmm. in that condition after the accident. Yeah, the reflections. And so, like, as he's being wheeled through and he sees it, you know, like, at no point were the, the doctors being, like, holding up a mirror, like, hey, you want to see what you're, like, that didn't happen. But because of circumstance, just because of the reflection on the cabinet or whatever that was, you know, he winds up seeing it as the corner of his eye as he's being wheeled by. And you see it exactly from his perspective. And it is kind of like a jarring, like, moment, not just to be, like... It's less of a, oh, that person looks weird sort of like thing and more of a because that's from your perspective, like you're understanding like he knows he didn't look look like that before. Mm -hmm. And he's saying in his own mind, he's saying like, is that me? Like, is this who I am now yeah. sort of thing? It's just like a really, really well done, super well thought out, purposeful decision that really helps the movie. It's all about the experience. It's like you're experiencing it with the character, which I it, it's. That's a great goal to have yeah. in mind, I feel, you know, not just for this film, but like so many films is like mm -hmm. experiencing something with the character. If this is who you're supposed to be relating with it at this moment in time in the film, then why not, you know, have have the audience experience something in the same way that the character would. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love the, the scene where he uh, first gets the idea to like follow through on his book contract and they call the yeah. publisher. <laughs> I think that's like one yeah. of the most like funniest like satisfying scenes yeah. for me. It's cuz she was like um I guess technically you have a contract for another book. <laughs> He's like yeah, I'm going to do it. 
even though he can't say anything, it's just the mm-hmm. speech therapist saying it. And I love how the uh, person she sends to dictate the book for him is literally just the first person that sat down <laughs> in her office. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I've got the perfect person for you. I love that little, yeah, you know, just visual kind of humor yeah. there. What's the lead actor's name? Uh, Mathieu. So like Matthew and then mm-hmm. M- A-M-A-L-R-I-C, Amelric, I think, or Amelric. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. was very good. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah, he was amazing. Uh, we saw him in Sound of Metal recently, which is kind of similar, I noticed, in a lot of ways. <laughs> you know, character learning. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very similar. <laughs> a lot of, you know, coming to terms with yourself and uh, maybe a handicap. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's like, yeah. there's a few mm. different takes on this, I guess, general mm. idea in a movie. There's a few different movies yeah, about this. This is a very strong one. Absolutely. Yeah, I guess that's also like kind of why... When we were thinking of Sound of Metal, I brought up that idea. I was like, oh, what if all of it was like, you know, from his perspective? Because I really love the right, idea of yeah. shooting something from someone's perspective, especially if they're going through this kind of turmoil, this kind of experience where like you can't just show them doing it. You have to bring it into their perspective at some points in the film, at least, you know, like that's mm-hmm. absolutely necessary. Otherwise, people won't have any idea what's going on, really. It's like nothing to connect mm-hmm. it to, nothing to compare it to awesome movie and yeah the um director credit on this so in the opening titles it just said a film from by julian schnabel and then on imdb it says also laura obiol i don't know how to pronounce her name but then it also said that she's credited as creative director and so she's like it looks like she's doing a lot of creative director roles so not necessarily the director but yeah on I, Daniel Blake, she's credited as movement director, which I don't know exactly what that. Yeah, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but that's what director. she's credited as. <laughs> so she works on a couple different things. Maybe she was a big part in the crazy out there perspective. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to. Because that would take a lot of testing, wouldn't mm-hmm. it, to like, get that to work? Yeah. yeah. And also, I don't know. So I've seen, I think, one other movie from... Julian Schnabel at Eternity's Gate. Supposedly before Night Falls is really good. That's on my watch list. Mm-hmm. But yeah, at Eternity at Eternity's Gate was the one that was nominated for acting from Willem Dafoe where he played Vincent van Gogh. And a lot of like mm, that's right. just watching that, what's happening visually, I'm like, oh yeah, this is the same director as Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Like it's really clear. Like he's got he's got some like weird personality when it comes to how he's showing his film visually so that much is consistent mm. for sure but yeah i'd like to see more from him anyway would you recommend uh, eternity's gate i mean is check it out i gave it a six so positive experience overall it's not gonna make my list it's not something mm. that i'm going to remember a lot but i would say it was worth watching it's one the fun. and i love the foe obviously okay yeah, well, on the phone. Yeah, it's got a great cast. Fond of me lobster. Yeah, <laughs> I am. I am quite fond of his lobster. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, yeah, we have to mention the the scene where he's driving and the attack happens. You know, like that's yeah. that part was fucking. Even it doesn't even matter how many times I watch the film. Like that sequence is just like terrifying, and I love that they mm-hmm. didn't show mm-hmm. it until like near the end of the movie. Like, they could have shown that at the beginning, but I I think it's, you know, just so many instances in this movie where the restraint of when they decided to show things and how they decided to show things and, you know, just generally the order is just, it plays such an important role in the overall experience of this film. Yeah. Yeah. And the performance as well is so convincing. Yeah. Yeah, that's really heartbreaking, that moment. Genuinely terrifying. Mm Mm-hmm. Damn, this director doesn't actually have that many movies under his belt. He's got like six or seven. Oh. One, two, three. I'd like to see more. Six, including a documentary. Well, I guess I'll check out some other ones. What would you rate this if we want to get to ratings? Sure. Diving Bell and the Butterfly. I mean, I have it at a 10. There are some things that I have uh, issues with. Like, there are some mild criticisms I have of it. But, like, I just think it's so... It's something that I'm going to keep watching forever. It's something that has a very Mm. huge impression on me and I'll always remember. It feels like one of those important films, you know, that that just 
should be remembered as a classic. And so, uh, yeah, I I have it as a ten out of ten personally. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um. I've I've got this pretty high in my mind. You know, when I was describing like what I wanted from Soul in the last episode, kind of what I got with this movie. Oh yeah. <laughs> A story so about appreciating life and the, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. the main character, he, he goes at the end and, you know, it's more consistent. But It's crazy what you can do when your movie's not for kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I think it just really explored this idea extremely well mm-hmm. in a very empathetic way. Covered all aspects of it from, you know, the spirituality side and the, just the, that, that scene where he is first learning to kind of translate and spell mm-hmm. with the, the blinking and he spells out that he like wants to die like that's oh, yeah. early on like a, that's a horrifying like moment and he mm-hmm. does kind of learn there's like so many like ups and downs with him coming to terms with it and like almost convincing himself that he's he might like make it through and he has the hope that he might overcome it and there's all the all the great quotes like cling to your own humanity and you'll survive and mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff there's a lot to think about it was oh, way yeah. deeper than i was expecting from yeah. the premise and yeah i i, I really yeah, like this from my first viewing i'd i'd give it a, a nine out of ten mm-hmm. when he decided to stop pitying himself and just you know take come to terms with the situation i think that made him a really likable yeah. character too uh, i get why you guys rated it high i really liked it too um very purposeful like you said it doesn't feel like an Oscar Beatty kind of movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just wish I, I no. love the first twenty minutes, and the rest of the film wasn't as strong for me, mm-hmm. which is why I'd give it a, a four out of five. Sure. But I thought it was really good and very powerful by the end of it. Think, yeah. Was it twenty minutes or more like forty? It was like the first act. It was like the first third. I don't know. However long we were just locked into his perspective. Yeah. But yeah. Loved it. Awesome movie. Very memorable. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Right, let's do some questions from the Sardonicast community then. If you want to leave your own, head over to the Sardonicast subreddit or there'll be a suggestion thread where you can ask whatever you feel would like. Oh, I just saw the name of the first Redditor we're going to answer. Hmm. The Turd Muncher has one for us. Nice. Do you guys think movies should have, have intermissions? Would the movie experience benefit from letting viewers get a bathroom break slash snack refill slash water? Or would it ruin the pacing of the film? I would say no, no intermissions, and it ruins the pacing of the film. I feel like that's what TV shows are now, you know? Like, they have, like, a little intermission. You don't have to watch the whole thing. Yeah. I mostly agree, but my problem is when films start getting over a certain length. Yeah, four hours plus? Yeah, I I would say two and a half hours. If you start going over that, yeah. If you are, like, a four-hour epic, I do feel like an intermission should be in there. Hmm. That that would be the most comfortable thing for me. It was a thing, you know, like fucking standard, 2001 yeah. Space Odyssey had an intermission, you know? Like. Yeah, I remember it growing up. I remember seeing, yeah, yeah the Harry Potter movies right here in really? Europe, like, had them. The Harry Potter movies had intermissions. Yeah, yeah, when I used to see them as a kid. Yeah, thing is, 2001 isn't even that long. I mean, it's over two hours, but it's not like a three and a half hour the long. The Harry Potter film. movies had intermissions? I didn't even know that. Yeah, I remember seeing the one with the basilisk. Whatever year that was, 2002, maybe? I don't know which one that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it had an intermission. Yeah. Do Lord of the Rings have intermissions? Fucking Titanic? No, not when I saw Lord of the Rings, yeah, it I didn't. didn't. Um, <laughs> Damn, I don't remember <laughs> having any intermissions for like movies when I watched like a decent amount of movies growing up, too. I think it depends on the country, because oh, there, was, there was someone replying to this thread saying, this is Blurry Face 29, from where I'm from, in India, movies do have intermission, and most of the movies are directed and paced in a way that it's designed to have a cliffhanger, oh, like yeah. in TV shows, before the intermission, which is fine, I guess, but when I watch English movies in theatre, it does feel abrupt when they pause the movie suddenly for the intermission. <laughs> That's While so watching funny. Hereditary, the brother comes home after the... Oh, can I say this without... Spoilers for Hereditary! Yeah, from the brother scene after the incident, and you can start to hear the crying of Tony Collette, and then it cuts to intermission. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I could see that being it, but I don't think Hereditary is a movie that needs it. Yeah, it's only an hour and a half, right? Oh, wait, no, it's two hours. It just feels yeah. like an hour and a half. Yeah, it's probably about two hours. Because <laughs> I remember this, this discussion last <laughs> coming up around when The Irishman came out. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And that's another one where it's like I, I have to like tactically decide what I'm what 
like how much water I'm going to drink and stuff, depending on the length of the movie. <laughs> that's a movie you watch. It. It's a Netflix thing. You can pause it. Uh, but yeah, I suppose that's a bad example because I did see that um, yeah. in, a, in a theater. I saw that in a theater all at once and I really enjoyed it. I feel a huge part of film is pacing and that you should watch it all at once. I'm like a, a Lynch uh, conservative or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you got to watch the movie all at once to get the full kind of package. What if you have a bladder problem? Ralph. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's true. You can just pause the movie. Yeah, I, I, I pee a lot. I'm full of piss over here. Well, obviously you have like some kind of human need to go, go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, go to the bathroom. Bring a bottle. Yeah, it should be made to be watched all at once because I think that's really cool. I love being sucked into a world for two and a half hours and then just, you know, coming out of it. I think that's much more fun. I know what you're saying. I feel as though... It depends on what's happening in the film. If they're like mm -hmm. fucking climax, you yeah. can't pause. You can't you can't pause that movie. Yeah. Especially after a certain point. Enter the Void, you know, it should be all like one thing. But there are certain movies where like even if there's like a lot going on sequentially and it feels like a big, you know, like a greater part of some epic or whatever. There are s parts with some downtime, you know, like the transitions from one scene to the next. If it's like hard cut to black, there's no music or anything. There's a there's something just got resolved in the storyline and it's about to pick up back on some other characters that we forgot about. Basically, it's like this might as well be like a new episode of like a fucking miniseries or something. Right. I feel like there are places where you can pause movies and pee without it really like negatively yeah. impacting the experience. And it also depends on the type of person, like if. You're easily distracted, I guess, or I, I don't know. Like, I feel like I'm able to get sucked back into it when I resume. Sure. There was also a time home releases of VHS tape oh, yeah. couldn't fit a Titanic. whole long movie. So it would be like two. Yeah. So it was basically like an intermission where you'd have to swap out the tape. <laughs> yeah. um, Double VHS. At Goodfellas or Casino or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. It's just too long. Um, but that's interesting. I guess it just depends on the experience and, mm -hmm. and what you're looking for. But I prefer all at once I, that's the way i like watching yeah films. i don't think intermissions need to be added into movies really but i i don't have anything against them if a director wants it to be there yeah i i, I just think about like i watched the new wonder woman the other day oh yeah <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> how was that I thought, oh, that was so good <laughs> i thought it was absolutely like dreadful i thought it was fucking abysmal um I just like hearing people talk about it but it, it's like two and a half hours long for some reason I, I, no, I don't want to sit there for two, two and a half hours without... <laughs> yeah, like, if it's a bad movie, you're going to want to pause all the time. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Even like um, on the superhero train, like when, when that last Avengers movie came out, it, it was close to like four hours long. And I, I, I feel like you could have easily built in like an intermission in that and it could have like built hype in the story or whatever. And there are ways to do it, mm -hmm. but I guess they want to... They, don't, they probably don't want to do intermissions because then you, you can show the film less times in the day or something probably adds a few hours yeah of... it takes a lot of time also i don't know as if i was watching something in a theater it, as much as it's like cool everybody has time to use the bathroom it's like not really even if you do 15 or 20 minutes like there will be a lineup like not everybody will be able to get in and then some people will get back in late and then it's just like okay now you're watching parts that are like well into the story of the movie and people are just like f finding their seats every like couple minutes and it's like that's kind of distracting you know yeah. Yeah, that is annoying. Get that over with in the first fucking five minutes of the movie. There, there's positives and negatives to it. Yeah. yeah. Seeing 2001 and having that 15 minute intermission, people would go out to like the, the concession area and just talk about the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, like what what are you getting out of it so far? And it, and that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I think that's just what I romanticize. I could see like an Avengers movie, like people just talking about like, man, Iron Man. So it, 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 the story's great so far. Yeah. Like theater still does it. Yeah, it is cool to be halfway through a story. Um, it's just what you want. I'm not opposed to an intermission at all. Mm -hmm. If a director wants it. Okay. Isaiah Little Bear has one for us. Could you guys explain what you mean when you criticize a film for being manipulative? I hear this a lot whenever Adam talks about Pixar and Alex talks about Illumination. Isn't the goal of most filmmakers to manipulate the viewer watching into caring for the characters and events <laughs> happening on screen? It seems a bit contradictory. 
There's a difference between being a nice person because you know that other people will be nice to you back versus intentionally lying to someone and being like, <laughs> th- th- there, it, this applies to real life too, with how you interact with people, right? Yeah. There's a difference between just like being a nice guy and people will be nice back to you versus like, I'm going to like completely lie and like pull this person's strings like fucking uh, in being John Malkovich, you know, the main characters being manipulated by... Um, yeah, Catherine Keener and being John Malkovich mm. is like incredibly yeah, yeah. manipulative because it's not genuine, right? That's what makes something manipulative. And so when I criticize a Pixar movie for doing something like that, it's about how like transparent and obvious it's being. It's the difference between like, I want emotions in a film to be earned. So an example of manipulative filmmaking is taking a scene that would otherwise be really not all that emotional but then you add that like tiny little high register piano like music with like a tiny bit of strings it's like bah, 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 bah. a character's dying oh no like but it's it's you know fucking slow death where it's like in their arms but it's like these emotions aren't really earned you're just using music to manipulate people in that way and in many pixar movies it's like the music isn't even the worst part about it it's just how they're writing the story it's like by committee it's literally just like a corporation has figured out how enough people not everybody but enough people to sell their movie will react emotionally to certain cues on a checklist of things that they can add into their movie it's no longer a story that's being told by somebody who's passionate about a story they want to tell and had a really great idea and wants to like communicate something about the darkest parts of their soul it's like a film made by fucking committee and that's what i mean basically what you said but i would i would actually flip it where I would describe Illumination that way. Yeah. And I, I would say Pixar's like the opposite example. I don't watch Illumination. I have no point of reference for that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I've sat through a single one. <laughs> you know, those all the things that annoy you about Pixar movies, it's mm-hmm. like that on steroids okay. in these Illumination mo- movies, where there's, there's not even like really an attempt to like genuinely tell some kind of story. Whereas at least you can point to Pixar and be like, Coco, you know, mm-hmm. that's a cool idea. Soul ambitious idea yeah what ambition or like story nugget is there for the minions mm-hmm. movie mm-hmm. you know it's it, that is like a boardroom yeah this thing is popular yeah of course you need to create some bullshit like plug in and they have like their, their their bag of tricks they always do they always have like little kitty characters and they really over animate the cuteness and all this kind of shit it's, it's just once you see through the formula and see how Illumination does this thing where they have these like B plots that just that they they they're completely pointless and they're, mm-hmm. they're just about like either manipulating the parent or the kid yeah. in some way and it's like so obvious. I would like to clarify that when I make these criticisms against Pixar, I am not saying that there's literally nobody on their writing team <laughs> or involved <laughs> yeah. in the production of the film that has any kind of ideas that they want to communicate that are personal to them. Like obviously in soul Coco in any of their films, there's somebody on board that's like, Oh yeah, I have this idea. It's personal to me. Like the, the nugget, the spirit of the idea has to come from somewhere. It's just a matter of whether or not that eventually gets molded into this factory product. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's the machine. So like it can start somewhere and there can be people on board that are like, you know, it's genuine to them. Them. but at the end of the day it's got to sell it's got to sell toys it's got to appeal to kids and you know mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't have the character die at the end blah, 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 you know stuff like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. it's just a matter of like how how much it's molded into this really anyway yeah i think you said it just how noticeable it is too yeah when it's obvious if, you, if you're able to get me on board with your story because it's you, you're just a great storyteller or filmmaker or you're doing something fresh and new it's like the turing test yeah it's like was this made by a robot or a human (laughs) (laughs) yeah all these all these big budget movies have to like ride the line on the just the reality of the the money side of it like it is a part of it yeah and when that line gets blurred in the direction of illumination is when i start getting like really annoyed yeah. You know, when it's just like, where, where is even the, 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 you're like forgetting about the storytelling part. It's like not even yeah. about that anymore. It's just there about is no like, story. It's just a series of dumb scenes. And then I guess they get around to the third act and they're like, this is when it's supposed to be oh, yeah. emotional. We technically have to make a movie, don't mm-hmm. we? <laughs> yeah. We have to hit the plot points, but it's not about reaching those plot points naturally. And I guess that's what I would call manipulative. Yeah. Yeah. It's got like no heart. 
Uh huh. There's nothing under the surface, yeah. you know. You gotta check off those items. Yeah, yeah. And they're especially bad because they they take like Doctor Zeus books. Oh yeah. Whatever and. Mm hmm. <laughs> you know, which which do have like a heart to them, and somehow they manage to fuck that up. Yeah. In the translation. <laughs> True. Majorly. Yeah, I don't know if I've seen a single elimination film, honestly. You didn't even watch Lorax for the memes? No. For some reason, <laughs> that was the one that, like, caught on with the meme. Because it's got... The, it has, like... It's a musical for some reason. Oh. Um, I've so it has a bunch of, like, it. really bad pop songs and stuff. Oh, like no. That, that people have really attached <laughs> themselves to. And, like, Stan. And there's, like, a whole deviant art community that's obsessed with, like, oh, all the characters. Boy. Did you say Stan? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they like Stan, um, the Wansler, I think it's called. Oh, okay. I thought oh. when yeah, you said I... pop songs, I thought you said they like made a rendition of Eminem's Stan. <laughs> no. I was like, that's in the Lorax? How did they work that into it? <laughs> now that would be a movie. Yeah, and like the 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 product placement thing is just the, the funniest. Like, oh, you that's kind of funny too. Shit up. Like, oh, satire yeah, yeah. is dead stuff with the, mm. you know, like the four by fours. Because like, the... that's like conflicting with like, the message in a way yeah four by fours with the lorax on them and stuff like that it's just <laughs> that's so funny you just can't let me see oh, let's see. list of illumination movies you got hop you got the min minions movies did they do horn here's a who that might have been a different studio uh the life of pets holy fuck they did life of pets <laughs> yeah I, I never saw those the second yeah, one wow. is like actually yeah <laughs> i've seen zero illumination films I think I'm going to keep that streak going. Yeah. No, I think I'm not tempted. As far as there's constant like trash animation coming out, but there's there's none that are as successful as Illumination. I guess that's what bothers me about it. Yeah. You know. They found they found the way to do it. Yep. So Despicable Me was like their first one. Mhm. Yeah. Wow. That that one was successful. And it's not even that bad of a movie. It's just kind of standard kids movie fare. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't until the second one that it got really bad, and then Minions, like yeah, you said, Alex, pointless hop. subplots. Yeah, hop was hop just like too far. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've taken it too far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh just, my God, the Minions movie don't. had a worldwide gross of one point one five nine billion dollars. That's so good. Yeah, <laughs> people love that cute uh, stuff. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's the part that irks me a bit. Billion billion dollar movie Minions. <laughs> <laughs> My God. And it just has no, it's like got no story. Like, what is that movie about, Ralph? They don't spend that much. No, they don't. None of it's their, none of their budgets are over eighty million out of all yeah, of their no, films. This, mm -hmm. this is part, this is part of it. Yeah, no, the, the, the minions are designed in a way Very to simple. be cheap to animate. That's why, yeah, yeah and copy and paste simple. a lot of the yeah. same like character a, model too. Yeah, yeah, they're reusing assets all the time. You see it in the background. That's Even amazing. Houses and cars. And yeah, you know. it's so strategic. You know, good for them. Good for them. <laughs> I'm not even mad. If they want to, yeah. if they want to be like fucking business geniuses like Jason Blum, you know, like fucking do it. <laughs> I'm not watching these movies. Nobody's forcing me to. Do you think the anime is compensated for? <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, maybe they should get a bit more of the pie. That's very true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to see the breakdown of that. <laughs> Where all that fucking money's going? But as said by Ralph Seppi earlier in this episode, capitalism. <laughs> 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 Quote Ralph Seppi. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it works, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do this one from Alfred Berta. What event from 2020 do you want to see as a film? Or as a person who lived <laughs> through these events, do you not want to see how these events are going to be portrayed in films? There's so many things that happened in 2020. Is there a Wikipedia list of everything that happened in 2020? Because there's a lot. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to be, be missing some of them. Holy shit. I wonder how movies are going to tackle like the mask thing. You know, like, everyone's it? just walking around yeah. with masks on. Like, if you make a movie set in 2020, is everyone going to walk around with masks on or without masks? Because it would be realistic for them to be wearing masks, but... Yeah, depending on... If it's in a small town, no. And if it's in a big city, then fucking 60% of people. If it's in people. Florida, then no. <laughs> in Florida, no one wears masks if the movie's set there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there would be no good reason to set your film in 2020 unless you're specifically making it about the pandemic or you know like a period piece on other events that happened during the pandemic exactly so. i was thinking all last year the best thing to do would probably be to make a period piece or make something on the future or just like fictional don't yeah. try to don't try to make 2020 into a thing <laughs> yeah don't make this a <laughs> <Yeah>. thing <laughs> unless you want to make it a like a contagion kind of movie maybe that'd be interesting in like 2020 
Yeah. There's a lot of shit that happened in 2020 yeah. despite the pandemic. I'm just trying to remember everything. There was like Kobe death at the beginning. There was They're like, already making like COVID movies. Isn't Michael Bay making a COVID kind of it's movie? It's not. No, he produced it and it's not COVID and it's stupid. I think it's already out. It's like some dumb. Yeah, somebody else directed it and he just slapped his name on it and it looks really stupid and it's already out and nobody paid attention. Like nobody mm -hmm. needs to see it. I forget what that was called <laughs> though. It looked super fucking low production value mm -hmm. let me let, i bet there is a list of notable events in 2020 i'm actually gonna search it i've got one but it's you know it's nothing it's none of the obvious ones oh shit you know yeah 2020 okay. at some point in 2020 they uh rediscovered the the true form of the spinosaurus so I'd, I'd oh. be interested in seeing the behind the scenes of that maybe is there's it? some story i know the uh you know, the dinosaur community is pretty uh Hot and bothered. They like fighting. I'm sure there's some like great bone war tier story to be told. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's a couple interesting ones. There's a New York Post article on 2020 major events. The uh, Harvey Weinstein verdict. That could be like interesting. Oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Get fucking yeah. some random actor to put on a bunch of makeup and win the Oscar, you know? Play Harvey Weinstein. Mm hmm. That's one I'd want a documentary more. So. Yeah, yeah, probably. True, true. But I guess that's also technically a film. Yeah, true. You could make a really, really good comedy off of, like, the Kim Jong-un death rumors and have, like, a movie about, <laughs> like, like Kim Jong-un dying and them putting out doubles and, like, pretending he's not dead. If that's what happened, nobody really knows right now. But... Do you remember the last time they tried that in a big comedy? Oh, yeah, that was... interview? Yeah, but, I mean... I would when I think <laughs> when I think good comedy I don't mean ones that like Seth Rogen's involved in <laughs> you know I'm thinking of like good in my version of good <laughs> uh fuck Epstein shit Ghislaine Maxwell all that shit going on <laughs> oh my god uh, yeah isn't that more 2019 uh I guess. no I mean it's I mean kind mm. of yes but like mm. the Maxwell stuff is 2020 for sure that's true okay I can definitely picture a bunch of events being told in like really crass stories. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of ways it could go wrong. Oh yeah, it's just it depend. It always just depends on who's behind it and what kind of intentions they have going into it. Yeah, the motive. Yeah, yeah. the purge is a good 2020 movie, although that came out like years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If I can talk about Trump getting COVID and. Make a movie about all the crazy drugs he took. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his secret Re drugs. Regeneron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucking baby fetuses. <laughs> Satanic prayers. I just kind of want to forget about 2020 as quickly as possible, you know? Done. Just move on. Yeah. <laughs> it's already behind me. I just hid in my house the whole year. Yeah, me I too. I know what happened. <laughs> still there. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Cinnamon Ghoul 17 has one for us. Thoughts on the new upcoming Aronofsky film? It stars yeah. Brendan Fraser as a 600-pound man secluded from the world, slowly eating himself alive. It's called The Whale. Hyped. Yeah. Sounds so intriguing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was reading the uh, on IMDb, its current story. It did sound very similar to The Wrestler, um, but obviously the, the context is very mm. different with mm -hmm. the characters involved, so we'll see how it turns out. Yeah, I was, you know, just just hearing about, like, the actor and director concept, and yeah. basic plot synopsis i was thinking kind of something similar to the wrestler yeah yeah i'm really curious to see if brendan fraser can i'm pull glad he's out. making another movie yeah after mother i'm glad he got money <laughs> i haven't seen him in a while i saw him in the poison rose which was like some straight to vod movie with john travolta and that was pretty bad but i'm, I'm glad he's like found a real role again <laughs> you know i feel like he could be good yeah, exactly. I, I, yeah, I'd like to see him in something really good. Like, yeah. is, does he have any like George of the Jungle? Like, what, what, what is it of Brendan Fraser's standout? The Mummy, obviously. The Mummy, the, the Mummy. Know, fucking, was he in Crash? I think he was in Crash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. He's uh, ask fucking moist critical Charlie. He's. I'm sure he's got like a uh, yeah. framed pictures of every one of Brendan Fraser's movies on his wall. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I immediately told him <laughs> about the news when I found out. He said it was fantastic <laughs> news. Anyway, I, I trust the director enough to be able to get something good out of Brendan Fraser, even if I don't think Brendan Fraser is a 
amazing actor independently of, of <laughs> other help, you know? Yeah. If he's being cast for it, then obviously Aronofsky, Aronofsky sees something in him. Yeah, this is one where the casting really has my eye. <laughs> it's like, mm. oh, how, how is this yeah. going to come together? It wouldn't be like a, as huge of a story otherwise. Or I don't even know if this is a huge story, but like mm-hmm. it's intriguing me. Like this is, I'm hyped for it. I'm very excited to see it. Like, yeah. yeah. Good for Brendan Fraser. You know why his like uh, his Hollywood career kind of it didn't end, but he stepped away from Hollywood for a few years. Yeah, I kind of fucked up. Heard yeah. something. He was he tragic, was groped, but I don't remember. Apparently, by the former president of like HFPA. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's pretty pretty fucked up. Really? You know? Yeah, and that like put him off for a while. But I'm glad like he's coming back in like a real film. That actually has me kind of excited to like see him yeah. again. Yeah, I, yeah. I uh, skimmed through his IMDb. Like he never stopped acting per se i mean like he's he's just in a bunch of like really smaller like he's in some tv show yeah much right smaller now. scale like i poison rose like those kinds of things yeah he wouldn't get big gigs like the mummy anymore and yeah i think that i think that affected his career yeah he was like a real big movie star for a time yeah yeah it, it shows you kind of how hollywood is how fucked up it is yeah yeah i don't know it's like you could say the same thing about michael keaton you know, mm-hmm. just some people just slowly kind of mm-hmm. disappear because <laughs> I don't know, maybe they get like a couple movies in a row that just didn't do great financially. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And then the studio is like, well, I guess that means that nobody wants to see them anymore. Mm-hmm. Like you can say the same thing about Nicolas Cage, but now he's like doing a comeback. Same with Keanu, where it's like, yeah, just because of the rules that they're in, like people cast them for these like schlocky kind of like horror action things that people are like oh yeah of course i want to keep seeing this person in movies you know where they just Mm -hmm. move towards lower budget things but now those are just doing incredibly well financially yeah yeah and then keanu goes into cyberpunk (laughs) (laughs) uh jay has one for us well boys I wanted to know what your thoughts on HBO's Euphoria is. You slated cringy OTT teen shows like 13 Reasons, but I think Euphoria represents the youth in a much better way and has stunning visuals. Well, I just finished it on Saturday. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Ralph, did you see it? I watched one episode. Very interesting. And I love Sydney Sweeney. Oh, I don't know who that is. <laughs> well, I guess I'll look it up. I really wished I'd I'd seen it before watching the last season of Thirteen Reasons Why because it's it is such a good show to contrast of like oh th- this is how you kind of do this in a much I know. <laughs> more creative original way yeah <laughs> yeah yeah the 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 presentation of it is so like frenetic and it really like captures the the like age range much better with the like music choices and just like what they're saying yeah, the camera work is really cool oh i love the cinematography yeah. that's like one of the my favorite parts yeah and the lighting too yeah that's my favorite part of it yeah is how it's presented yeah this isn't really a spoiler but like every single episode opens up with like this sequence of yeah, like that's what I was about to say. narration voiceover and just so much energy and it's so quick and you're getting so many different locations and scenarios Focusing on like one character at a time, basically fleshing out their backstory before the real plot of the episode begins every time. And it's like, man, I would love to see more of that. I love those types of it's things. It's such a good idea. And the camera work is just so impressive, the way that they transition from one shot to the next and just like so much energy in the music and like it's got such a great vibe to it. I really love it. Yeah, that that intro thing is, is such a good idea because mm-hmm. you really keep track of the characters too because it's quite an ensemble oh, yeah. cast so there's a lot going on so having you like learn the the, the group gets like fleshed out more mm-hmm. as the episodes go on and you get those those intros and they're like oh wh- wh- who are you going to get this time it's really exciting yeah yeah great show it, it's a very sensible way to flesh out these characters when if you tried to incorporate these exact same bits of information into like the actual story of any given episode by either dialogue or flashbacks like that might just seem like a little bit clunky but because of how it's structured and it's like okay well this little intro is just dedicated time for that and it doesn't seem out of place it's almost kind of like weirdly omniscient in a way you know with the narration Mm -hmm. coming from the main character who a lot of these things like you know she probably wouldn't know Mm -hmm. but it works really well i love it it's there's a lot of great yeah. stuff going on in the show and you can tell the series creator sam levinson you can tell it's like a really personal 
project for him. You can, mm -hmm. t you, it's so obvious that there's so much of himself in the story and the characters that he's written. Yeah, I'd seen one of his films, Assassination mm -hmm. Nation, which I noticed was very similar in like theme oh, yeah? and how it tackled like un the youth of America oh, really? kind of. Okay. Yeah, this uh, that movie's about like a bunch of like teenage girls and they like start shooting up their fucking you know neighborhood and it's about like yeah. social media. And... Yeah, I didn't see that. It looked kind of bad. Yeah, it's it's okay. It's definitely it, it's out there and there's mm -hmm. some elements I really like to it. Um, but Euphoria, I feel Euphoria is definitely better at tackling those kinds mm -hmm. of things. It's a little more subtle, a little more realistic. Yeah, Zendaya is very good in it too. I've never seen her like Zendaya. actually act. Die, <laughs> Zendaya. Yeah, yeah, she's a really good main character. I know. I was so happy to see her do something that wasn't Spider Man. I was like, whoa. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I'd only see her in Spider Man, and like she did this show on Disney Channel like ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, like it's actually see her like she's in a real yeah. role. It's like, oh, she's actually pretty good. And, she's yeah. great. Yeah, very yeah. fitting for the role. She pulls it off perfectly. Mm -hmm. Perfect, like a loof main character. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's very believable in their part, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's like a high school kind of drama. I think that helps. Yeah. It's like, it's so great at capturing like current youth sort of. Yeah. Just think idea. of 13 mm -hmm. Reasons Why, like compared to exactly, that shit. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It makes it even funnier. Well, because they incorporate things like, you know, so many times in the show, this isn't really a spoiler, but like certain characters at different points, it's like, People just share each other's nudes all the time. And, you know, sometimes it's like a bigger deal. Sometimes it's not a bigger mm -hmm. deal. But it's like that's like a real <laughs> like consequence of like growing up in the digital age where like nothing's private yeah. anymore. And like people can weaponize parts of your life against you and social media and stuff. And it doesn't do it in like a weird, cheesy, forced way. It's just it tackles these subjects really really well i love how they approach these things and it was only after i finished the entire series recently that i was like man 13 reasons why i really <laughs> fucking s i mean like it always <laughs> sucked but like when i started comparing the two because I, I was thinking like yeah this they tackled this issue and this issue and this issue it's like there's a lot of the same issues that were tackled over you know this yeah. one mini series versus uh, or this one season versus four seasons of 13 reasons why a lot of the same issues were tackled just like one of them was manipulative calling that back and one of them wasn't as much really mm -hmm. and yeah. based around a gimmick yeah they trap themselves because 13 reasons why about like a debt yeah yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> it just makes no sense to continue it beyond that it, it's made for that audience of like teenagers too this is definitely a much more mature show it's hbo there's lots of drugs and nudity and like all this shit yeah and and i think that helps a lot in like establishing a realistic world um composed compared to 13 reasons why which is very sanitized yeah it feels like a bunch of 20 somethings pretending to be in high school whereas yeah euphoria actually feels more Kind of legitimate. Mm -hmm. It's very raw. It actually gets some like visceral emotions out of you. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh shit. Yeah. And I'm giving Euphoria an eight out of ten. I haven't seen the whole thing. I won't rate it, but I like it. It's yeah, I'd good. probably give it about <laughs> an eight too. I had some criticisms with it here and there. Not nothing like huge, but yeah. Awesome show. Everybody should check it out. Malcolm and Marie coming soon. Same director and Zendaya and a uh, Tenet guy. <laughs> the Tenet guy. Tenet. <laughs> Tenet guy, nice. The protagonist. John David Washington? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tenet guy. Okay, let's do this one then from Greenhood 300. Hey, hey, Sards. Have you seen any of the Jendi... Oh, God. Tartofsky works. I've, I've only ever read his name. I've, like, never said it out loud. He is the Stanley Kubrick of animation. His works are Samurai Jack, Clone Wars 2003, Symbiotic Titan, Dexter's Lab, the Hotel Transylvania trilogy, and his new show, Primal. I know, Ralph, it doesn't have Nick Cage. Yeah, that's the show. I, I know. <laughs> Primal and Nick Cage is bad, yeah. I've, yeah, I've been a long-time fan of him. I, mm -hmm. I think his art uh, kind of style is, is so, like, recognizable. And yeah. You know, expressive. I, I love the like Clone Wars show and uh, Dexter's Lab. Yeah. And, like, even yeah. like the Hotel Transylvania movies are weirdly good. Um, okay. Yeah. The first one I like. It just purely in terms of like the art direction and the, the actual okay. animation and the like frenetic nature of it. Because it, in Primal too, it, it's like mm -hmm. a, about like a caveman and a like a dinosaur kind of teaming up. Okay. Which sounds stupid, but they sell it, man. <laughs> it, but the animation is so impressive. His 
his creativity is holds no bounds. You know? I, I can't say I'm a fan of him, mm -hmm. but I've seen almost all of his stuff, and that's just from it being so like in the forefront of animation. Like Samurai Jack, I remember watching. Yeah. Dexter's Laboratory, I remember. Um, all those other things. Hotel Transylvania is actually pretty good, even though that's like an Adam Sandler kind of thing. Yeah. No, surprisingly good. It's actually kind of funny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was involved with uh, Dexter's Lab and Powerpuff Girls. Those two things I love when oh, I was Powerpuff younger, Girls, yeah. especially. Okay. Not yeah. the new Powerpuff Girls. That's different and bad. <laughs> but the old one is <laughs> great. Yeah, I watched both of those things growing up and really loved it, both of them, for their humor and their style and, you know, very, very... Uh, unique very uh <laughs> distinct there we go that's the word i was looking for mm -hmm. yes very distinct. yes immediately distinct yeah i watched a bit of samurai jack growing up nothing I, I like i always appreciated the style of it i was always like oh this is an interesting thing it was like cool that you know there was like a good amount of uh maturity from it obviously yeah. um but i never really yeah there wasn't a lot that like hooked me on it i didn't Mm -hmm. you know religiously watch it or anything i've just seen bits and pieces yeah, yeah. i think it went over my head because i was so young watching it but i really liked it i thought the animation was cool yeah i just couldn't follow the story or anything <laughs> yeah, so, yeah i don't think there was mm -hmm. a whole lot of story <laughs> from what i remember I yeah <laughs> in samurai really, jack really good action i might be wrong dexter's but... lab was really funny though <laughs> I'm like i noticed the, the i noticed the animation similarities like the style of all of them but there's a lot of variety too, tone and genre. Mm -hmm. Samurai Jack's very mature. Powerpuff Girls is very like friendly. Dexter's Lab is. I, I love Dexter's Lab. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Oh, it's, it's awesome, a very yeah. funny yeah. show. Yeah. I'm yeah. Little from my, I'm Ralph, little did you from see my... his Star Wars show? Mm, What'd you say? Did I you haven't. see that as a kid? Uh, his Star Wars show, Clone the, the Clone Wars show. From oh, I've actually seen yeah. some of that too. People Not love religiously, that. but I've seen a few episodes. Yeah, people love that shit. Yeah, it's genuinely kind of sick. <laughs> yeah. I am. It makes it way cooler than uh, anything that's in the movies. Okay, Because cool. I remember that mm. coming out before the movies or something, like before the third movie. So I was like, whoa, this like this General Grievous guy? Damn. <laughs> and, then, and then the movies kind <laughs> that's of funny. The rest is history. <laughs> yeah, the movie's terrible. He's in there for five minutes, yeah. I don't know. I would say Stanley Kubrick of animation is a little much. <laughs> Based on what I've seen. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan <laughs> of that. I, I'm not sure I would give that title, but... I mean, why can yeah, he not just be like himself good... anyway? Why do you yeah, to... fuck that. <laughs> exactly. Good point, Alex. Thank you. He's an excellent artist and a very, very talented and successful artist. Yeah. The yeah. new Spielberg. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not tiring, yeah, isn't it? New Spielberg. Yeah. He does for animation what sharks did to grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> Getting a little confused now. <laughs> You've said it so many times. <laughs> <laughs> that not <a> quote. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. I don't know if I would ever just watch something because his name's on it, though. I'm. I don't think I'm gonna watch Hotel Transylvania. I don't care how much you guys say it's good. I don't think I'm ever gonna watch it. I wouldn't recommend it for you. Yeah. <laughs> Considering I was walking into Thank it you. like dreading it, it was actually kind of funny and, and enjoyable. Primal okay. seems interesting. That seems more up my alley yeah. for a mature audience. Yeah, I think animation nerds, especially, like really mm -hmm. love his his place and in, in history. You know. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right, I guess that does it for questions. Thank you so much. And I believe we've got a recommendation. I believe it's Ralph's turn to recommend a oh, film. Oh, it is. Cool. Um, I'm going to recommend a film from a director we've seen before, Tarantino. <gasps> <laughs> and that movie is uh, from 1997 called Jackie Brown. Oh, shit. Awesome. Yeah, All right. So check out Jackie Brown. I think it's streaming on Pluto TV, whatever the fuck that is. Yeah, what the fuck <laughs> what? is that? I got a Blu-ray somewhere. Yeah, I have a Blu-ray. Go watch, guys. Yeah, everyone can find it. Yeah, Jackie Brown, Tarantino movie. It's one of the ones people haven't seen as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've only seen it, I think, once or twice. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Been meaning to rewatch it. Okay, awesome. So if you don't want to be spoiled for Jackie Brown, directed by Quanton Tarantuni, Check it out before the next episode of this podcast. These episodes air every two weeks. You can listen to them early by going to sardonicast.com. Sign up for premium. It's $2 a month. You get them as they're edited. Also, patreon.com slash sardonicast. Also, we got merch. Yeah. 
Sign up. Buy our merch, or I'll slap your phone Fucking, out of your hand. Well, <laughs> like Tarantino. <laughs> do something <laughs> terrible if you don't get our merch. I'm not going to tell you. You'll just have to find out. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. 2001. Bye, Thanks, everybody. 2001, they'll <laughs> say. 2001, they'll say. Bye-bye. 2001, they'll say. Bye. Bye. <laughs>